Let's see. Okay, so we're here with Greg O'Gallagher, also known as Kino Body on YouTube. If you have not seen his stuff before, he's probably one of the OG natural fitness YouTubers. And, you know, there's a lot of speculation if he's actually natural or not, which is sort of what we're going to be getting into in this video. So um, do you want to give like a quick background of your history on social media or just like, I don't know what you're all about? Because if some people don't know, um, I don't know your history on the platform as well as kind of like what your messages that you kind of like mainly put out and how you help naturals achieve the physique of their dream sort of thing. If you just want to give like a quick uh, synopsis. hundred percent. So um, I actually jumped on YouTube really early back in, you know, like 2008 when I was 14, 15, I, I was very into fitness. I was working out a lot. I love sharing my progress, sharing my workout. So I actually had a YouTube channel called GOG9 when I was a teenager. And it some of my videos were hitting like, you know, 100,000 views. Um, and then I, I shut down that channel because I was a little bit shy. I was young and, you know, my whole school kind of saw the YouTube channel and started playing. They started playing it in class. And I just I didn't love the attention back then. I was, a lot, I was, I was actually quite shy. And, and, uh, and then I stopped the channel. And then at 19 years old, um, I restarted the channel focusing on really teaching fitness and teaching sort of what I want to see in the fitness industry, which was teaching men how to look like movie stars, you know, I had movies coming out with Christian Bale with Ryan, you know, Gosling and these guys got in really good shape. And that was the kind of condition I want to aspire to looking like I was on the movie screen, not just bulking up and getting, and getting bigger, um, and getting huge, not just losing weight, but having that, that Greek God movie star type physique. So in 2011, 2012, I started Kino Body. I started really teaching people how to get that lean chiseled look. At the time, I was probably like 180, 185 and, you know, 14% body fat. And it was like really my goal on like how to master, get kind of getting that, that chiseled look, like getting very defined. Um, and that's when I started talking about fasting, started really pushing the idea of, of training, you know, just three days per week, focusing on the key lifts, the key muscle groups. Um, so on and so forth. And like, ultimately just finding, you know, the, the challenge of course has always been like getting lean. How do you, how do you make that diet so easy, so enjoyable to follow so I can actually stick to it because as a, you know, 18, 19, 20, 21 year old, I couldn't stick to any diets. I, I tried almost everything, um, tried doing small little meals, hitting the calories perfectly. And I just failed on everything. And, and there's, I just, I had to simplify it to make it really, really enjoyable. And the result was very good. Um, I started getting leaner with my, you know, focusing on three lifts, reverse period training and stuff like that started getting very, very strong. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of achieved a very, very good condition, especially at 24, 25. That's actually, that is actually a kind of a good point to reference is that like 24, 25 was really where 24 was really where I got the steroid accusations. Mm -hmm. I sliced down to about 160, 869 pounds at 510. Um, my body fat, I never did a DEXA scan at that point, but my body fat levels were very, very low. Um, and, uh, and, you know, interestingly enough during that period, I was actually doing very, very, very low volume of training. My body, funny enough, um, responds well to low volume, literally four exercises, a workout, two, two hard sets, sometimes three. That's where I, I, I make my crazy enough. That's where I make my best gains. And and that's where the that's where the uh, roid accusations started. At the time, I was fucking so pissed. I was getting so so many steroid accusations, and I was freaking so pissed off. Um, it, it 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 affected me a lot. Um, and then you know, like like anyone going on YouTube, when you first start on YouTube and you get hate, it fucking pisses you off. Um, and I just remember seeing all these videos coming up. And I was like, fuck, I wish I could just prove I'm freaking natural. I wish I could do something. Um, and then, and then, uh, then that, that period I was doing a lot of like sh uh, video shoots where I'd lift hundred pound, 120 pound dumbbells. We were rushed. I wouldn't, war I wouldn't warm up. I'd do dragon flags. And I did in my, in my program, I did a lot of heavy weighted chin-ups and I had a, a very, uh, very bad injury, um, elbow tendonitis. And so I, I literally, to the point where I couldn't even text, it would hurt. I had to do voice notes. Um, I couldn't, yeah, I couldn't type, couldn't, uh, couldn't work out very well. Um, and, uh, I did a bunch of different like sports massage therapy. Um, and it took about three months to find someone that knew what the hell they're doing. 
And uh, so about for three months, I actually, I documented this on YouTube. I, I did not work out. Um, and I did lose some muscle and put on a bit of fat. Um, got my testosterone levels checked was around six, 620. And then, um, I did another testosterone test as I put on some muscle, um, over the course of two or th like three months. And, uh, my, my testosterone levels were like 660. Um, but that's sort of like, that's sort of like the mid twenties phase. Now I'm 30. How did you heal? What was the thing that helped your tendonitis the most from the like therapy, the, like you said, massage therapy, like, cause that's something a lot of people deal with on like tricep pushdowns and stuff like that. Like, how did you get through that? Yeah. So, and also, you know, Martin Burkhan, he's, he's definitely talked about this, but when guys are doing like, when you do a lot of te uh, texting, uh, typing and heavy weighted chin ups, it's a very common occurrence. So I, I tried doing like, I, people told me about active release therapy. I, I tried doing that, did nothing for me. didn't help at all. Um, they did like some like knife thing where they're scraping the arm down. Mm. It was a while ago. And then, you know, you may have heard of, um, so my camera guy, uh, Mikey Del Monte, his older brother was Vince Del Monte. And he was yeah. one of the earlier guys in the, in the fitness scene. Um, and then he shifted completely just to teaching business, business coaching. Um, but he, he told me, he's like, I have this guy. He works with professional athletes. Um, you got to see him. You got to see him. You got to see him. And like the wait list was like a month. I'm like, I'm not booking it. I'm, a month is so long from now. I, I didn't care. And then finally, Vince Del Monte just booked me. And he's like, you're booked. You're going in tomorrow. I'm like, really? And it was, it's called um, MAT, muscle activation technique. And it sounds like, it sounds like complete bullshit. Like if, if someone told me this, I think it's bullshit. Basically, <laughs> he just, he tests your muscle strength. And he, like, basically my, if this, if this was the arm that was injured, Mm -hmm. I couldn't straighten it down all the way. It'd be like, here, I couldn't straighten it down. And they test your muscle resistance and I'd have no strength and they do some massage techniques and then retest me and I'd be stronger again. And in one session, I felt way better. Two, three sessions, I was completely working out again. And it was like, I did three months of, of spending 200, like $100, $200 sessions with no improvement, not working out. And then two sessions, I was back to normal. Um, then the other thing that I had to do was like, I had to stop you know, really going super heavy on weighted chin ups, the dragon flag, which is a cork size looks sick, but by, you know, the position on the hands relative to the elbows and there's some torque is just the injury waiting to happen for me. So I, I, I don't do that exercise. And then, um, and then, you know, I, once you get up to like, cause a lot of guys in my program get very strong, they get up to hundred pound, 120 pound weighted chin ups. Once you're over hundred pounds for six to eight reps on, on weighted chins, you don't really have to keep pushing beyond it. Like, you kind of learn with some exercises, you know, you kind of milked everything you need out of there. You don't really need to get up to 160 pound weighted chin ups. Um, at that point, you have all the, you know, the back width you, you, most people want for that movie star look. So then doing more sternum pull ups, going a bit lighter, pulling the chest to the bar, getting a bit more thickness or doing some rows helps. So if you're chasing 150 pound chin ups, it's, it's, it's going to cause some, uh, some problems. And then the one I learned from Martin Burkhan, he did an Instagram video about this and there's some research on it is just, uh, doing like wrist curls and doing like slow negatives, bicep negatives with your arm supported, getting a slow negative, feeling that tender spot, holding it there and getting some blood flow to it. Doing that two, three times a week after your workout probably helps more than anything. Hmm. Okay. And the last, the last thing I found really helped and this helped when I hurt my hand was uh infrared doing infrared reduces inflammation and like makes a big difference if you have an infrared light it uh it it literally doesn't work for everything but like for some of the elbow stuff and the hand stuff made a big difference all right on no, that's good because i think a lot of people deal with that chronically and just like have no idea what the fuck to do other than to not work out and i guess like you know tricep extensions and some of those exercises are fucking ruthless when you have the tennis elbow yeah. And so, um, so we have your blood work as far as like the whole natural thing you were talking about, how it annoyed you and in your mid twenties and whatnot. But before that, I think talking about your training is kind of interesting. And I don't really talk about training on my channel very much. So I think it's worthwhile, especially somebody who's achieved like a great natural physique and has kind of what many may see is or not understand as far as like training philosophies and like how you regiment it. Like you mentioned, you do like the reverse pyramid training and like low volume three days a week, you know, seems kind of counterintuitive potentially to some people who are new to the gym and just think you're supposed to like more equals better. So like, what is the general breakdown of your split? And has this remained consistent over the years that you found to work the best? Like, I know 
you've talked about your first working set should be like your heaviest set, obviously, because that's when you have the most ability to tolerate load and you have the most, like the least fatigue. And obviously at some point though, you work, like, do you do like work up like feeder sets that are just like a minimal amount of, I don't know, warming up just to like get the area, like circulation in there and get, you know, the ready, get yourself ready for that heavy top set. Or yeah. What's like the process. So, I mean, you know, I'll, I'll like preface and say that I've been very into working out in fitness since I was 13 years old. I started lifting weights at 13 years old. I got heavy. I would be buying fitness books at the store online, ordering like there were websites of, of, of fitness people like Ross Animate way back in the day where you could order and they ship you their, their, their fitness book. I was obsessed with this stuff at a very, very young age, started doing weighted chin-ups at 14, 15. I actually achieved my first one-arm chin-up at 15 or 16 years old, which I was stoked. I was doing like 80 pound weighted chin-ups at, 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 at six, 15 or six, 15 actually. Um, so I was like on fitness crazy. And, uh, and then, you know, the thing I realized for me, you know, was that for my physique to look as good as possible, really, it just meant two things. One, having my body fat extremely low, like very low. Uh, and that all that required was being in the, the right calorie deficit and sticking to it. And then for my physique was just getting as strong as possible. And I found that, you know, I tested all kinds of things at higher volume, the 20 sets per whatever muscle group, this and that. And, and a lot of times, like what made my physique look insane was just being as strong as possible. And when that was the focus, like, let me get as strong as possible for six reps. Then my training kind of shifted in that direction. And I was like, damn, like if I cut my, if I just do three workouts a week and, you know, keep my workouts a bit more short. Um, I can hit PRs easier. I get, I recover better. I hit more personal records. If I just focus on doing two or three hard sets and just kind of dropping the exercises down to just four exercises per workout, but every exercise I'm pushing myself hard on, I hit more PRs and my physique looks better. And then the stronger I am at a, at a certain body weight, the better I look. And I just, and then when I deviate from that, my physique's not, not as, not as, not as good. So that's always been the focus. It's like end of the day, you know, and I think there's some been some good, Good fitness people have talked about it. Joe DeFranco, he's a strength conditioning coach for football players. He's like, you have your four key exercises for football players. And that might have been bench and box squat and, and chin up and stuff like that. Um, and so I find that the most important thing is, you know, you have your four, four key movements. You're getting stronger every month. And if you hold like your hand to that fire, you really start to see what works best and what doesn't. And then within that framework, I'll work out three days a week. Um, two upper body days, Monday, Friday, and then legs on Wednesday. Um, and one of the, you know, you have tremendous shoulders. You have some of the best shoulders. Um, I'm well known for my shoulder development. And I think one of the things that have allowed me to build very, very good shoulders is if I do an upper body day on Monday, that's more, more chest focused and, and arm focused. Well, then when I go and hit my shoulders on Friday, my upper body is so fresh. A lot of people, they'll do chest on Monday and then two days later on Wednesday, they're hitting shoulders and some of those muscles, their chest, their triceps, some of those pushing muscles are still recovering. And I found it very hard to actually build your shoulder press up in that structure. So for me, I'll do Monday is upper body with more chest focused. And then uh, Friday is more is upper body with more, you know, shoulders back focused. And it's literally just, you know, I'll do two to three lighter warm up sets with lower reps, you know, eight reps, a bit heavier, five reps, a bit heavier, and then two to three reps, rest three minutes, boom, get that nice heavy money set for six reps, and then drop the weight 10%, hit another set six to eight. And then if I want a third set, I'll drop the weight and do eight to 10. And it's just every single set is hyper focused on hitting that personal record. And it's interesting, like when you're doing seven, eight exercises, four or five sets, it's too much to literally push yourself and hit a PR and everything. It's just a lot. Like the challenge is finishing this exhausting workout. But when you like cut it in half and it's short and it's like, this is so easy. This is too easy. What am I doing? Then you're like, then you can push yourself and get those reps. So I've, I've definitely made, I definitely made my, my best gains on a bit less. Um, but that's the focus. And, and, you know, one of the benefits of, of this style is on Monday, you know, I'm hitting heavy incline, some flat bench, some arms, and I'll finish off with some, some rest, pause, rear delt work. And on that workout, even though I'm not really like hitting my shoulders intensely directly, yes, I'm hitting the rear delts, but the, from the pushing my, you know, a tear delt gets a lot of work. 
Um, from the rear delts at the end, you know, I'm, I'm getting a lot of work. And then on the Friday workout, I'm hitting heavy shoulder presses and lateral raises. And that structure is probably the best thing I've ever found for developing the shoulders. They're getting crushed very intensely once a week. And then they're getting some good, um, good, you know, indirect and some, you know, in uh, posterior direct work once a week. I found that works really, really well. Um, and you know, I, I, I personally think that there's a, a decision you have to make where it's like, I either want to have a huge, massive chest, or I want to have really freaking impressive shoulders. It's hard to really do both. Um, yeah. I, <laughs> I can, yeah, I guess that's fucking, I, for me, I think a lot of it's genetic more than anything yeah. though, but I do, uh, that's definitely in my case, like poor chest, good shoulders. Yeah. Like look at, you look at Scooby fitness the guy had massive chest. Uh, and he did train his, like he did a lot on his chest, a lot of, I think he did two thirds flies to one, to one press, whatever, but yeah. he, he hit his chest hard twice a week. Um, uh, but his shoulders were non-existent. Like, yeah. and, and he was probably, he was, I think self-admittedly, I don't know if he was, but he was clearly on, on, on some substances, but, um, um, he's going to be pissed if I say this, but <laughs> I think he's like, yeah. well, how, how heavy is he? He's way above F, FFMI, I yeah. think. Um, uh, but, but, uh, yeah, I kind of, I kind of found, cause when I was younger and doing more bodybuilding type workouts, I actually, my chest was more dominant than my shoulders. Um, I found it, it's very hard to like really, you know, really like have a huge chest and a shoulders. You have to kind of pick. And I, and I found that the shoulders, um, is a much, a much, uh, more desirable look. Hmm. So as and far it, as like choosing, like, obviously if you're doing three workouts a week, it'd be like very specific about what exercises you're allocating your like fatigue limit to. So like, did you ever try, like, presumably some people might be thinking, huh, if I put in like a fourth workout where I hit like each compound lift one more time, maybe I can squeak out like double the PRs in a week. Or if I did, I don't know, the same compound lift on a Friday that I did on a Monday, I could potentially try and squeak out another, you know, two and a half to five pounds a week that I might've not got otherwise and double the pace of the results. Like for you, how did you come to the conclusion that yeah. of selecting certain things for each day and not having overlap of other things? Because presumably if you're working out three days a week, maybe you could hit heavy incline bench twice a week. I don't know. Yeah. So yeah, there's a way to do it. Um, the challenge is like if Monday you're doing more chest work. And then if you're going to do incline again, a second day, it would have to be on the day you're doing shoulders on Friday. I I deep down believe if you're going for personal records on shoulder press or bench press, you need to have at least two full days of rest before. Mm -hmm. So if you're, if you're trying to do a shoulder, a PR on chest on Monday and then a PR on shoulder on Wednesday, it's going to be tough to make those gains long-term. Like the, the, I, from my experience, like that, the muscles require 72 hours and, and the, the chest and shoulders, there's going to be overlap from, from pressing. So if you were to do Monday, big chest workout, and then you want to do another chest work on Thursday, or, or maybe you want to do shoulders on Thursday and then a chest on, 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 uh, on, uh, Saturday, it's harder to hit those PRs from my mm -hmm. experience. And, and you know, what? I, I, in my fitness content, I always tell people like, do not just take my word as the voice of God, test it out for yourself, yeah. try it yourself and, and see for yourself. But I, I always found like, you know, you know, even if I was going to do like heavy weighted chin-ups when I was building up my chin-ups up there, you know, if I was going to do those on, on Friday, if I want to hit some extra arms on Wednesday, I wouldn't be as strong on that, on that Friday. I needed like a solid, you know, uh, solid amount of like, so yeah, I, like, so basically two full rest days. So if, you know, I do heavy, uh, heavy shoulder press on, on, on Friday at the very minimum, I need Saturday and Sunday rest before I do any more heavy pushing. Um, of course, if you want to do a bit more leg work and you're doing some in intense leg work on a Wednesday, you could probably do some lighter stuff on the Saturday. Um, do some lighter extra leg work if that's something that you want. And in my new movie star masterclass, I, I put a little bit of extra um, workouts to do on the on the, the Saturday. But that's been my experience. It's very hard. And again, like this is because of my training philosophy, you're pushing close to failure. If you're leaving two to three reps in the tank, you could probably do it. Um, but, but I, I, I like pushing close to failure. I like going for PRs and maybe leaving one rep in the tank, or maybe just getting that last rep that you can possibly get. And if you're doing that, you really want to have two, like, like two complete full days of rest before you're, before you're hitting, you know, any sort of pushing muscles, pulling muscles, um, or if you're doing or the legs and hitting any leg muscles. 
They're like working sets per workout. Like it sounds like it's like eight to 12 in totality. Is that accurate? Um, yeah, I've, 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 uh, oh, uh, a working set. Oh, for the, the full workout. Yeah. So like if you were doing four exercises and there's like a top, like your right. PR set that you're trying to get max weight on, and then maybe like a back off set, and then maybe like a third where you're going for like 12 reps or something like you're at most hitting like 12 working sets per workout. Right. Is that yeah. accurate? I'll do, uh, so on the, on the very low end, it would be eight would be the very, very low end. And I go up to sometimes I'll go up to 15, 16, sometimes just for fun. I'll, I'll like do a nice period of lower volume for two, three months. And then, you know, I'm like, you know, then I'll, I'll then I'll do like a month of just doing more volume, more reps. And in the, in the beginning, you're like, damn, I feel fuller. I feel, I feel bigger. But if I keep that up, I, I, my strength kind of plateaus or, or dips down and, and I'm not as sharp. So, um, like, so for example, if I go to LA for a few weeks, I'm going to go to gold's gym. I kind of want to do a bit more volume, have fun in the gym and the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, but, so I'll do anywhere from like eight to 10 sets per workout on the lower end. And that's honestly where I see some of my best PRs and thus my physique. And then on the higher end, I might do five exercises, a workout, three sets, maybe four sets for arms. And that will kind of push it higher. Um, and, you know, on paper, you know, you, you on paper, be like, yeah, that the higher volume theoretically should build you more muscle and should should work better um, is maybe more in line with the research. But um, at the end of the day, the most important thing is progressive overload and whatever allows you to hit progressive overload is important. And I think that some people do a bit better with a bit more volume and some people do a bit better with a bit less volume. Um, and, you know, in like my last course I released, um, there's two phases. There's a more of a, more of a, a moderate, lower, moderate volume phase, and then like a more higher volume phase to just do for a month, which I like doing. And I think that like, there's some benefit where if, if you're doing lower volume for a while, there's like a really nice benefit. If you switch to high volume for, you know, a training phase. And then if you're doing high volume, there's a nice benefit where your recovery is insane and you do lower volume, the PRs come. So I think there's a benefit to each. Um, I know that Greg Knuckles, um, who's, you know, pretty, pretty smart guy in the fitness field, he sort of credits the, the, the result to the high volume stuff. And then, mm -hmm. you know, you get stronger from the low volume, but he credits most of that to the high volume stuff. From my experience, it's, it's, it's the, I, I, I'm the opposite. I'm like, no, the, the, the low volume is where the freaking is where the strength and the PRs and the physique is made. And then the higher volumes, the icing on the cake. Is there any body parts or exercises that you firmly believe should be on the lower end of the rep spectrum like six versus 12 plus because it's like you know some people might think compounds like heavy incline bench a heavy squat to go for a pr or something like maybe you go down to i don't know six like you mentioned six for your top set on incline bench but then if you're doing arms like do you go for a pr at six reps on like a bicep curl or like how do you kind of decide what is allocated the more higher rep set versus lower rep set. Yeah. Most stuff I will, I do like the, you know, six to 10 rep range. I think when I was a bit younger, I did like kind of a bit more four or five reps. I, now I do, I do prefer more of the six to 10 triceps. I like higher reps for sure. Um, go, especially on the elbows. If you're going for five, six reps, it doesn't really work. I'm usually more yeah. eight to 15. Um, biceps. I, I, I kind of like, you know, six to 10 reps. Um, I find that, you know, like, it's interesting for me, if I do a bicep curl rest a little bit, like I think my biceps are a bit more fast twitch where like, I'll see my, my reps go way down if I don't get enough rest Whereas yeah. triceps, I, I I'm a more slower twitch for me where I can, you know, I can pump out a set, rest a bit. And I can hit that same set, same reps easily. Whereas biceps, my biceps fatigue so fast. I'll have a great first set. And then the second set, I'm way weaker. Um, but, but so I, so I find that triceps, I, I tend to do better with higher reps, biceps a bit lower, but more in the, you know, five to eight rep range, as long as my elbows can handle it. Um, I find shoulders do better for a bit more on the higher end of the rep range. Okay. And especially if you're doing standing barbell presses, you know, if you're going for four or five reps, it's just so much stress on the core, the stability. If you can do like more six to eight, just it's a bit smoother. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, I, I tend to like six to 10. Um, where I'll go, you know, most of it, six to eight, some eight to eight to 10, and then, then triceps and stuff. I'll, I'll go 10 to 15 and, and lateral raises, obviously shoulders, the, the isolation work. I like higher reps and no one, I haven't seen anyone really do lateral raises well for six reps. It just, it doesn't really work too well. Uh, just the, the movement just naturally 
responds better to, I mean, if you, if you want to do like really, really short rest periods, you can do six reps, but if you're talking about like, you know, uh, doing like an actual, you know, six reps with good rest, it doesn't work that well. Um, so shoulders try some like higher reps and then, uh, everything else kind of like sort of in that, that six to 10 rep range. Um, but, but I mean, and there's some evidence to think to suggest that, you know, that going under five reps isn't as beneficial for muscle growth. Um, because you get pretty much maximum muscle fiber recruitment when you're doing an all out heavy set for five to eight reps and there's nothing else you're gaining from doing it two reps, just you're getting lower volume, mm-hmm. um, as far as the muscle recruitment. So I, I'm generally, you know, five to eight, six to 10 reps, and then a bit higher on, on some things. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's where I, that's kind of what I gravitate towards. What about like descending order of priority? Cause it's like, when you go into the gym, you have your maximum output capability for allocating to whatever your first exercise is. So like, presumably maybe this, the answer to this is whatever your weakest body part is or weakest, you know, exercise that you put that first. So you can improve on that the best maybe, but like for you, is there like a tried and true, like on your Monday, you do like incline bench first. And then there's like a descending priority because as your fatigue accumulates, you can allocate less ability to, you know, beat like a heavy fucking PR on the lesser priority things. So yeah. Like, like your Monday workout versus your other two workouts. What are kind of like yeah, the, the main the, things? Yeah. The, the way that would play out for me is like, I'm very happy with my back development, even though I, I don't need to do much on my back. I, I don't do that much. My back width is very solid, like solid for my goals. Um, but like, I do want my arms to get bigger. So on some of these workouts, I will literally do, if I'm doing a couple chest exercises, I'll do biceps first. And then for my last exercise, I'll finish off with, you know, either some rows or some sternum pull-ups and that I'd rather hit the biceps fresh. Um, this is, and th- this is kind of stuff that for beginners doesn't really matter yeah. at all. Um, because you have to actually like train for, you know, three years, minimum four or five years to really, you know, uh, have different parts you want to prioritize outside of just a conventional, um, program. Um, but, and then, you know, something I'm playing around with, or I have played around with a little bit was if I'm doing, you know, incline bench first, potentially doing like a, a intense tricep movement second, and then going back to, to another chest exercise. And, and it's interesting. Some of the, one of the things I actually, you know, um, came to my attention, not even that long ago, six, seven months ago was, was triceps is one of the triceps by weight is actually like your second biggest upper body muscle. Mm. It's like shoulders, triceps. I think I forget who it was memo or, or someone did an analysis on, on the weight, like the muscle groups by weight and, and, uh, triceps was bigger than your, your chest and has potentially more, more muscle weight on size. You can gain to your triceps than your chest. Um, and so I'm, I'm, pretend, I'm looking at, you know, it's looking at doing a bit more triceps a bit earlier. Um, but, but, um, yeah, if you're I, I don't a newbie though, like, would you tell basically everyone like on the first push workout, do you like incline bench first on leg day? Do you like squats on pull? Do you like deadlift or like a bent over a row or something? Or like, what is kind of like, yeah, your... yeah. I would say, you know, and, and again, this comes back to your key exercises. So if your key exercises are, you know, it could be flat bench, could be incline. Let's say it's incline, uh, incline press is one of them weighted chin ups, shoulder press, and then, and then your leg lifts. I'm not a Nazi about having to do heavy squats and deadlifts to me. Mm. If, if, uh, if you want to do that, do that. I, I, I like doing Bulgarian split squats and Romanian deadlifts. And I find that, 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 that does, that gives me everything I want for my legs. Um, you know, and, and I, I do, you know, I do see people that, you know, squatted 400 pounds, deadlifting 500 pounds. And in their, if, if they're not careful with it in their, you know, mid thirties, late thirties, so just, they're not like, they're not like, do you, like, if you're, if you are obsessed about hitting those heavy, heavy squats and deadlifts, there's a lot of time there's a price to pay in your, in your, you know, forties. And yeah. have, have, have you seen it or do you disagree? No, no. Like, yeah, I think that at some point you hit a level of strength too, where it's like yeah. fucking sketch to try and keep hitting PRs on that exercise for the rest of your life. Like maybe you should allocate your, you know, fatigue resources to a whole new exercise that hits your legs. So then you can start at the bottom and like ramp up in weight rather than if you went in and hit four plates on squats, like every fucking time for like years on end, mm-hmm. you're probably gonna have some rough knees. I imagine at some point. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I suffered from a, a low back injury when I was a teenager that, 
is solved, but it's one of those things where if I, if I start being like, you know what, let me get to a 500 pound deadlift, you know, it, it, it's it, that, that, that dormant injury comes back to haunt me. And I'm like, mm-hmm. you know what, I would rather feel mobile, feel good, you know, not have pain, feel like sharp. Um, and then, uh, then, uh, then hit a 500 pound deadlift and then I'm having back pain when I'm driving my car. And then in 10 years, it's like, you know, it's end of the day, like you want to be as functional as possible. And, you know, if you look through that lens of functional has been a a term that's been misused massively in the fitness industry, but if you want to be as functional as possible, great deadlifting 500 pounds, squatting 450 pounds for three, but now you can't really, you know, now you have all this back pain. Uh, and again, that doesn't mean it's going to happen. Like I'm, yeah. there's some NFL players that freaking hit insane numbers and and they feel good. And, you know, but also they have, they're spending, you know, five, $6,000 a month on physical therapy um, or, or, or and massages and, and, that and all these things. And, and so like you have to weigh that and put that into consideration, but, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy just, you know, doing some Romanian deadlifts some Bulgarian split squats, maybe some of the knees over toes stuff. Um, and, uh, I think you can, you know, if you push yourself hard on these leg movements, you can build really good legs, but also at the same time, um, one of the things that's helped me with my upper body development, my shoulder body development is that I only hit legs once a week, really. And at the end of the day, you know, as you're gaining muscle up to your, you know, potential, um, if you, if you train upper body hard twice a week, lower body hard twice a week, the muscle building partition, like people. People kind of think, oh, I'm getting all the anabolic responsive legs. I'm, I'm getting all the benefit. Like, I'm, the, the legs are going to help me build my upper body. Legs are going to help you build uh, my upper body. At the end of the day, if if as you're building up to your, your muscle level, if you can gain you know, 20 pounds your first year, whatever, 10 pounds your second year, five to six pounds, the more you hit those legs, the more of that muscle growth is going to get eaten up by your legs. Mm. Um, and so I find that putting two-thirds of attention to upper body versus legs really helps you build a great upper body. Now, obviously if your legs you find are lacking, you can flip that. But, uh, but I mean, you know, I find that, you know, and again, if, if when someone goes on gear, um, because of the, you know, androgen receptors that, that like they, someone that's natural, I think it's, it's, if, if they fall, if you have two people, one that's natural following, um, a, a program that's two upper, two lower, one guy on gear, two upper, two lower, the, guy that's natural is going to have a higher percentage of muscle growth from legs than the guy in gear theoretically. Um, which I, you know, I could be wrong, but that's just kind of, you know, that's kind of my theory. Cause when, when you're on, when you're on, guys are on gear, it's just like, it's easier for them to, to get the big traps, the shoulders, mm-hmm. the, the chest. I have to be extremely strategic about it where, you know, I have to, you know, really hit the incline hard, hit a lot of shoulder presses, keep other muscle groups a bit more, you know, a bit more minimal. Um, but, but, um, it's, it's an interesting, interesting theory, but you know, um, so I do like doing more, a bit more on the upper body. And, and my sort of belief is that, you know, if you can gain 10 pounds of muscle over this amount of, amount of months, if you go too insane on the lower body, great. You're going to have six pounds, seven pounds on the lower body and a few pounds upper body. You're not going to look that much different. Hmm. Um, and, you know, I talked to one of these guys, Brad Pilon, who's really, really, you know, smart in fitness. He did the book, eat, stop, eat. And, and he has even a theory where like you're, if your fat free mass index, you can reach is 22, 23, 24, maybe it's 24. Um, I think I'm close to about 20 high 23 is 24. Well, you can hit 24 and you can hit that with more upper body size, more shoulder size. But then if you want to try and add more muscle to your legs, there's a, a cost mm-hmm. and it's going to be harder to hold upper body size. Um, so you like, that's the kind of thing that I found fun with fitness is like, like Arnold Schwarzenegger said, he's like, you are you know like it's like what are you saying pumping iron like you know i'm a, like a, i'm an artist you know you like I'm a, I'm a crafter i'm building the sculpture and so like that's what like i i find really fun for me is is like you know at the end of the day you know when i was 24 25 and i got the most accusations i was 5 10 160 6, 168 169 pounds my legs were smaller back then um uh they're qu- quite a bit smaller but it, it was like really easy to dial in that upper body physique um, and you know, now I'm like 175 to 180, probably closer to 180, uh, 179 today. And, uh, I, I, um, not as lean as I was back then, but, um, again, like I'm going to look my best in the mid one seventies. And yeah. so then it's all about proportion and, and, and shape. Um, you know, the idea that I'm going to get to 190 and, and, and maintain my body fat is, 
it just it, it it i'm 30 it's not it's it it hasn't you know i've got it and it's this is the one thing i've learned you know when you're lifting for so long um is that like i can do the lean bulk get up to 187 188 and i'm like theoretically i'm like yeah if i lead down i should be chiseled i should hit my six percent at 180 pounds or 182 pounds it never works out once you get the body fat down to like the low level you're back in the same place you were when you're 25 Hmm. Um, or maybe a bit, a bit more if, cause I did put on some like, but like it's, it's end of the day, it's like, you know, it's, 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 yeah. If I want to get down to like, you know, everyone's 5% bullshit, this and that I've done DEXA scans where I was, you know, 6%. Um, and you know, I did, I did a video with Greg Doucette and he gave me the benefit. He's like, yeah, you're probably, he did the calipers and the calipers had me at, you know, one test had me, the, the DEXA I did with him was seven. The calipers had me at nine. He's like, yeah, you're eight. So my seven on the decks is eight. My six on the decks is, is seven. Um, now the YouTube comments were saying like, oh, you're not 6%, you're 11%, 12%. Shut the fuck up. It's, <laughs> like it's, yeah. it's, yeah. When people try and do the body fat thing, it's like, hey, if I'm 11% yeah. and I want to get down to 5%, where is this 10 pounds of body fat coming yeah. from? Is my, yeah. my back is very, very lean. I don't store fat on my back. My legs are very, very lean. I store the most fat on my, on my stomach. So it's like, but, but like, because my back and legs are lean, um, I, I score really well on the, if you don't look at my back and legs, I, I'm like, your my body fat test decks. It looks really, really low, but, but yeah. So, I mean, that's kind of like, yeah, that's kind of a little bit of history and that's sort of where I'm at. And, and the, the one thing I'll say, like, not like to pat myself on the back is that there's so many people in the fitness scene to, to follow, to watch, and you watch them and they say one year, they say keto, the next year they say fasting, then they say this workout, that workout, that workout. I've been dead ass, like consistent since I was 20, I, 19 years old. I was really carving out my theory and, and getting in groove, it, getting into the groove at like 20, 21, 22, but I've been like very consistent since I was 24, 25. Yeah. I've learned some things and sprinkled in rest, pause training and, and done a little bit of like, you know, that, but like three workouts a week, boom, 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 key lifts, fasting, this and that it's been very, very consistent. And the reason it's been consistent is because I've, I've tried a ton and this is just what works for me. And, you know, my clients, people going through my programs, um, it works very, very well. And it's like the biggest bang for the buck. And my goal isn't to spend my life with fitness. Like my, 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 my goal isn't to make fitness take up so much of my life. I just want to have the best physique I can possibly have, have fun with it, let it fall in the background, build my business, have a sweet social life. And within that lens, there's literally nothing better. Yeah. So, okay. So right now you're at like your peak, I don't know, body composition is like you're in the one seventies now at like 8% or what is it? Yeah, I'm right now I'm 179. Um, and physique, I, I put up a little, let me see if I can, let me see if I can find this. I put up a little video of my shape. Um, let's see if I can find this. I put up a little video of my shape yesterday. I can send you this video clip. Quick note from one of our sponsors. This is AG1 by Athletic Greens. This is my daily green supplement. I use to supplement my fucking terrible diet. No, I'm just kidding. It, <laughs> it's, uh, but like, actually my diet is, uh, I think it's pretty good and balanced. However, the vegetable component, the fucking vegetable component, boys, not not good enough. It is, uh, I just don't have time, to be honest. Like I've talked about it before. I've talked about this stuff on the channel before too. I don't have time to wash vegetables, cut them up and shit, and just like make it happen, to be honest. I get, I have enough time, enough time is spent even eating the food and cleaning up the fucking dishes preparing more is just like not feasible. So for me, um, I went many years, you know, having a pretty good diet from like a macro standpoint, pretty good from a micronutrient standpoint too, in many different areas. But then this would be like something that I felt was good to be my backbone, like insurance policy of sorts for my lack of veggies. So like whatever antioxidant support I could be getting, any kind of greens that are otherwise completely missing because I'm just not, frankly, not gonna fucking prepare them. Um, this gives me a little bit of peace of mind that I have something in there that is comprehensive and had, I don't know, other people that I trusted essentially talking about it. Like for me, I had seen this stuff talked about several times on like science-based podcasts, individuals in the community, um, that are well-respected, um, generally, as well as content that I follow and learn from too. And ultimately when I'm looking to 
find something out. Like I'll defer to individuals that I trust and educate myself watching their material. And if they're using something, it's kind of like, for me, the most likely thing I'm going to clue in on as what makes sense for me to use. Because I don't, I don't have time to research shit that is out of my wheelhouse necessarily. So for me, when I'm trying to dial in what is the go-to option, I had seen this mentioned enough times, enough people had given it their stamp of approval. Uh, they reached out to me too, to uh, sponsor the podcast. And I was like, damn, like fucking three birds, one stone, bro. So for me, this is essentially, again, this is not going to make up for a shit diet, you know? Hit your micronutrient needs, get your protein in, get your, don't overdo the, you know, macros too, don't overeat. But certainly this is something that I think provides a backbone, like insurance policy of sorts for those who are in a similar boat to me and can't, don't have the time or otherwise are just frankly not going to fucking do it, get their greens in. So again, not the ideal scenario um, for everyone. Some people love their greens. Some people have giant salads on a daily basis. That's great, you know, for them. For me, I'm just an individual who would rather use something like this. One and done, slam it down, I'm good to go. So that is why I use it. And if you want to support me, you know, you can check it out too. And it gives you a um, free vitamin D and K2 supplement as well. So this is um, something that lasts for a year, actually. It is, and if you don't know the benefits of K2 and D3, K2, something that should be, it's pretty, some people don't get it through their diet, you know, as optimized as a diet as you have. Like oftentimes K2 is deficient in diets alongside things like magnesium and um, I don't know, vitamin D, obviously, as well. Like literally what I just fucking said, what this is, vitamin D and K2. A lot of people are deficient in those specifically, and that's kind of why this is a little add-on bonus in the product. So you get that for free when you order AG1 and you sign up, as well as you get free five travel packs to bring with you on the go. And uh, they also feature MK7 in their uh, vitamin K2, which to me was uh, sort of reinforced my um, confidence in that they know what they're doing from a scientific perspective and are staying on top of the most cutting edge nutrition literature. Because again, this is something that, you know, things like using methylfolate instead of folic acid, vitamin K2 with MK7 and the complex, that kind of shit is kind of like things I clue in on to see if they know what they're talking about and are actually like doing due diligence to update their formulas accordingly as new literature emerges. So anyways, this is what I'm using. If you want to check it out, it is linked in the video description below. The link is athleticgreens.com slash more plates, more dates. And you can click on that link to get a free year supply of vitamin D and K2. On the website, it says um, one free supply of vitamin D, but rest assured the K2 is in here as well. And it comes with the five free travel packs, like I mentioned with your first purchase. So you can check it out. Like I said, athleticgreens.com slash more plates, more dates, support me much appreciate when you guys do stuff that helps support the brand and back to our regularly scheduled programming. But like, uh, pretty lean, pretty like this is me right now. And again, like, you know, I've been lifting since I was 13 years old. Um, I'm 30. So it's like, there's not, you know, I, uh, my condition just like, it's not like this condition is way better than last year. It's like, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I, it's kind of just, uh, kind of just maintaining, maybe getting a bit leaner for a bit, putting on a bit, like getting a bit more strength, but you're kind of just, you kind of just in the same, same spot. For the amount of muscle you gain, like per year, you know, the whole natural, like what is your limit of how much you can gain? Like how many years did it take to kind of reach your, you know, with actual proper programming and diets, reach your kind of like right now, you're kind of just like eking out like little tiny bits per year potentially, but to get the foundation of like the 99% you've built, how many years do you think that would have taken if you did everything right from the get go? And how it's, many did it take? Yeah. So it's hard. So me, it's, it's hard to completely understand because I started lifting literally before I hit puberty. Mm -hmm. And I, I hit, pu like I started lifting as I hit puberty. Um, and like, I definitely had some years where I was lifting, where I was 15, I put on 20 pounds in a year. Um, I did put on some body fat for sure, but some of that growth would have been a byproduct of puberty. Yeah. Um, so, and then at 18 years old, I did get to 180 pounds, but my body fat was definitely higher. Mm -hmm. And I hit a 315 at 18 at like 182, um, for one rep, 315 for one. I'm, I'm 30 now. The best I've done on 315 was seven reps. So it's like, you know, 18 to 30, you know, I, I went from, which, which is equivalent of an extra 60 pounds. Mm -hmm. It's like a, you know, an extra, so it's like my, so I technically from 18 to, to late twenties, I added, uh, you know, 60 pounds to my bench. 
um, which is, again, it's like, you know, so the thing is, is that you can make, from my experience, you can make 80% of like your, you build your 80% of your physique in the first three to four years. And then, you know, the next five to 10 years, like, you know, five years, you're really shooting for that extra 10, 20%. Um, yeah. That's, that's sort of been my experience. That said, that's if you've hit the ground running, you know, you're 18, 17, 18 years old, you start training, you train weekly, you track your workouts, you're pushing yourself, your nutrition is pretty much on point, And you don't deviate, you don't take a month off. Like I once I started lifting, I haven't taken a month off. The only time I took three months off was when I had an injury. Other than that, maybe a week off after going hard for, you know, three to four months, but not even more, usually four or five days chilling. Um, but most, a lot of people, they train and then they'll, 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 they'll miss a couple of workouts and then they, they skip the next week and this and that it doesn't work to really make solid gains um, and build like 80% of your potential um, in the first three years. You have to really, uh, you have to really uh, be completely consistent track. And that's the, that's the, where I see people making great results is when they're tracking their lifts and they're tracking every workout. And then where I see people kind of making initial gains, but then just getting stuck and doing nothing is when they don't, they go to the gym, they go through the motion, they go through the sets and reps. Maybe they push themselves. But they have no idea what they did last time. They don't know if they added five pounds or a rep. So the only way to really make solid gains beyond like the first very easy gains is to track everything. Um, and then when, when you, you're then like, for me now, now, like, if I didn't want to track, I could just maintain and not really track my lifts and, and just go in and because I know what I'm doing. Um, I'm just trying to maintain. But, but like if, if when you're trying to build yourself up, you got to be like very, very on, on, on the point. On yeah, the point. It's, it's wild how many people don't track. And it's like the most crucial thing I would imagine, especially if you're doing one. You only have one chance per week to go up. And it's like right. if you like give that up because you forget what you did the week before and you do some like the same thing or potentially something that's not useful. Like you just wasted like a quarter of a month of fucking like gains, you know? So, yeah. Like, did you have a log book from day from the, like when everything started picking up for you or? Yeah. Since I was like 14, 15, I had tons of books tracking my workouts. Now I just do it on my iPhone on my notes and I tracked everything I did. I played around with like, I did starting strength as a, as a 15 year old, I did the starting strength program for, and, but that worked well to get my squat up. I got my squat up, but my bench didn't move as much. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I found a lot of limitations with a lot of different trainings that I, I, that I, that I, that I did, um, adding but, that incremental weight per week. So obviously even as a, like, if you're natural, it's like infinitely harder, you know, to handle the. I don't know, volume and whatnot and recover. And like, obviously it's that much more important that when you go in the gym, like you're ready, knowing exactly what you're trying to hit, how many reps you want to try and get with it, presumably too. And you have a very specific goal of what you have to beat from the last week. When you start to like, when you're a newbie, you can stack on like five, even maybe 10 pounds a week for like the first however many months. But then after that, it starts to taper off and five pounds a week becomes a more a big jump, honestly, like the fact that yeah. gyms only have two and a half pound weights per increment. That's pretty fucking hectic of a expectation to try and go up by every single time. Like, did you start implementing micro plates like those one pound plates or? Yeah, you know what? I actually, we, I even sold micro plates at one point and that was helpful. The 1.25s. Yeah, mm -hmm. I found that for, you know, most upper, upper body heavy lifts, um, the idea like, you know, going up 10 pounds a month um, is feasible, especially like, you know, as your beginner. Um, and, uh, and I did do micro plates. I never really liked, you know, I stopped selling them. I, I stopped kind of doing it. I, I liked it for a bit. Um, but I just kind of found that, you know, if you're doing an incline bench, the first set's four to five reps, when you hit five reps, basically add five pounds the next week, just do four. And that four might actually, theoretically, if you're doing 225 pounds, for five, mm -hmm. it's actually easier to do 230 for four than 225 for five based on the predicted one rep max. But regardless, you know, hit 225 for five, the next week you go to 230. And even though 230 for four is easier, you just, because you're just stronger, that fourth rep is going to be finished nice and easy. That fourth rep is like usually pretty easy. Um, and then, and then the next week you just stay at 230 and you add that fifth rep. Um, and what then, if you're stuck on that fifth rep though? Like there's a, there's definitely a range. Like let's say you're doing, I don't know, six to eight or something and you get up to eight reps of two plates on incline bench. Yeah. Now the next week, maybe you do two thirty 
for six and you get that. And then the week after you try 235 and or you try 230 for seven or eight, but you still get six again. And it's like week by week, you're stuck at fucking six. And do you go below the six and increase the weight? And then like at some oh, point, yes. what yes, do you do when you question. plateau? So uh, for, I'll do like the, the six to eight reps, eight to 10, whatever that, that um, progression model for dumbbells. For barbell, I just like to do uh, four to five reps or five to six, mm -hmm. seven to eight, just because, um, you know, doing like adding, like doing two extra reps is a way bigger one rep max um, than, than just uh, adding five pounds. So, so uh, like, yeah, like if you do 250 for five, if you do 250 for four, getting 250 to six is, a, is like a 20 pound increase in one rep max, as opposed to just adding f the five pounds, letting the rep drop one. Uh, it's a little confusing um, um, for maybe the listeners, but but basically um, uh, for barbell, heavy barbell movements, I do uh, uh, four to five reps or whatever. Then for dumbbells, I do four to six, six to eight. But um, if if you don't hit that, I do exercise rotation. So it's sort of like West Side barbell. Um, if I'm doing incline bench for three, four weeks, usually people can make PRs for three to four weeks in a row. And then usually that fourth or fifth week is freaking tricky. Mm -hmm. Unless it's obvious because, you know, if you added five pounds, if you did, you know, added 10 pounds every month, you know, and, and it, at 10 years, I'd be incline pressing 100, 1500 pounds, yeah. be incline pressing yeah. the Lambos. Just yeah. kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Those are like three or 4,000 pounds. But, yeah. but, um, so, so then like what ends up happening is, um, I don't like to, if I'm pushing on incline for four or five weeks in a row and I'm stuck, I don't even like to try and hit that next week. If like, if I hit that plateau, I'm, I'm done with that exercise. And now I'm going to do dumbbells for the next three, four weeks. Or now I'm going to be like, you know what? Let me switch things around. Let me do um, like a close grip bench press or weighted dip. Um, so if I'm hitting PRs, I stick to that exercise. And if I do not hit a PR that week, then I will shift exercises. And if you're cutting and you're not trying to build strength, just you can just stick to the same exercise for three to four weeks and then, mm -hmm. then change it. Um, but, but I find that exercise rotation works extremely well. And because, you know, you're with my system, you're training very intensely. Reverse pyramid training is very intense. So, you know, if you push the same movement very, very, very long, it just can, it can feel very taxing, very mentally taxing, neurally taxing. So having that fresh exercise every three to four weeks, it's like, damn, you know, it's like, it's like, let's like, you, you feel, it feels fun. Like it brings, it makes the training very, very fun. Um, and you know, um, West side barbell talks about this, um, you know, rest in peace with Louis Simmons. I am pretty sure he passed away recently. Um, Joe DeFranco, who was somewhat, you know, uh, was, was very big on West side. He kind of talks about this. Some of the other guys talk about it. Um, so we'll do like a stretch test with it as they're warming up to their, let's say incline bench bench, they, they test their stretching. And if they're stretching, like after doing the set is, is less then it's a biofeedback that like they should change exercises. I don't do that, but um, I'll, I'll just, you know, hit PRs for three, four weeks and then change the exercise. And then, you know, you might have three different movements. So, you know, you might have, um, you know, flat, but you might do, you know, flat bench one week. And then if you plateau after three, four weeks, you might do a close grip bench. And then the next time you might do a weighted dip and just cycle through those. Um, and then every, every three, four months, you should be stronger on that, on that main key movement, the, the regular bench press. So if you have like three to four opportunities to beat a PR on a main compound and you have like years of experience, obviously, like at this point, you know, pretty clearly what your top PR is for incline bench versus the exercise you swap to versus the third exercise you might swap to. When you swap, do you go right up to match your previous PR or do you try and beat it after taking like four weeks doing something else? Yeah, good question. Um, depends. I would say for people that are new to this, start a bit lighter because there's a lot of a technique. There's like a technique issue. So if someone hasn't done incline bubble bench press for, for, for years, then they might need a couple, couple weeks just to kind of have their form on lock. Like I've done so much incline bench, like my form is so tight. So I can take a month off of it, come back and be just as strong. So like, let's say I finished off incline at 275 for, for five reps. I spent a month doing dumbbells, got a bit strong on the dumbbells. I'll come back and I'll either do the same weight, 275 or five, or just start five pounds lighter, but, but pretty damn close. Either a, the same weight or a bit, or just one level lighter. And then, you know, then I might do, so then I might do 275. It's probably safer to go five pounds lighter. Then I might hit 270 70 for six. Um, then the next week I'll go 275 or five, stay at 275 
and then get six. And then I might go up to, uh, to uh, uh, 80 for five. And then if I hit 280 for six, let's fucking go. Like that's fucking great. And yeah. then, you know, but then, and then if I, then if I start to plateau, I get stuck, we'll go back to dumbbells. So I'd say generally speaking, start it off one level lighter just to give yourself that initial win and get that nice, nice, you know, kind of win under your belt. Um, but if you start like 10 pounds lighter, then the amount of time it takes you to get back to where you were, it's just, I don't think it's, it's necessary. Okay. So you, the two things you mentioned are getting really fucking strong and getting lean are like the two pillars of getting the physique you want. So doing those concurrently, obviously there is like kind of a like give and take on that relationship of trying to get like super fucking lean and also super fucking strong. So when you were getting these PRs, but also maintaining like, you know, borderline eight to 10% fluctuating, like constantly, do you think you could have got this peaked faster if you just like hovered closer to like 12 to 15% and then been able to cut down after and like reap the rewards of that progress in a shorter, more condensed time frame, Or do you not think it made that much of a difference at all staying this lean? Uh, you know, that's a really, really solid question. Um, can you give me two minutes? I got a freaking, uh, yeah, sure. I, I, gotta, I gotta, gotta grab my freaking, yeah. Okay. Sick. Give me two minutes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, so we just had a piss break. Recording's back on. So if you need me to, I don't even remember the fucking question. No, I remember this it. question. Basically, could I have built my strength faster if oh, I yeah. let myself? Like, I imagine a lot of people are thinking, okay, it took Greg, you know, this long to get to where he's at, or it took three to four years to build eighty percent of the progress. Could you have got that eighty percent within two years or two and a half years if you? Will hovered around 12 to 15 percent at a more conducive body fat to building rather than being eight to 10 percent all the time. And then, like, if you, I don't know how many people would have the patience for this, but staying not fat, but like not aesthetic as fuck for two to three years in order to eventually get to your aesthetic, like where you want to be in a shorter time frame, like, would that be a something yeah, that you thought would have? Work. Yeah, I have a I have a long winded answer for this. Um, the first thing I'll say is that like I have to be pretty objective. Um, is there a faster way to do it? Like the reality is, and people ask me, how long does it take to build your physique? How long does it take this? You might never get there. Like that's the reality. You know how many how many of your friends do you know that freaking go to the gym and incline press 130 pound dumbbells? The reality is like the idea of looking for the shorter path. Um, it's a good thing to do. But you have to be like realistic where some people will, will never like never hit a certain level. Um, and, and like if you're always trying to find, you know, the shorter path, um, it's like at the end of the day, you know, I freaking love the fitness journey. I love training. I love figuring things out, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't. But it's like it's, uh, you know, it's uh, that's like the pill people are going to swallow where it, like not I, I, you know, I've built up to doing, you know, 315 for six, seven reps on bench with lower ab veins and stuff, some people genetically will never, ever get there. I would love to tell them with, with my program, anyone can, can rep 315, you know, for six reps chiseled, not ever, not ever can do that. Um, I, I definitely know I have, you know, very good genetics for that. But as far as, you know, my belief is that if your goal is to look as good as possible at 8%, uh, at 8% body fat, there's no benefit for deviating more than two to 3% from that. So if you have to get to 12 to 15% body fat to gain muscle, then to cut down to 8%, you're better off just staying at 10%, 10, 11. Um, deviating, deviating too far from that, it can throw things off because then you have to spend time cutting. If you hit a really solid bench press um, or incline bench press, when you have an extra eight to 10 pounds of body fat, it's a different lift when you get rid of that fat. Um, it just, it, it feels different. Um, if you look at, you know, Olympic level gymnasts, yes, they're doing more body weight stuff, but they've built, they develop and build their strength without having to put on, put on fat. Um, they build extremely high levels of strength. Um, and resistance is resistance, whether, you know, you're doing a lap pull down or pulling yourself up with one arm or doing handstand pushups or shoulder pressing hundred pound dumbbells, resistance is resistance. And they are, they're able to build, um, uh, strength without having to put on 
15, 20 pounds of body fat. So I think that if, if the end goal is to be as strong as possible, yeah, it might make sense to, to, to kind of get up to 12 to 15%. And then you can eat a lot more, recover better. Um, but if the goal is just to be as sharp as possible, I don't, I think it's counterproductive um, to, to do a deliberate bulk. And I just, I haven't seen it. Like I haven't seen it. I don't know. It's hard to say. Um, it's hard to say, but I just haven't seen it work out that well. Like not really with naturals. Um, the, you always kind of end up like kind of, you know, wasting your time. Like I've had, a, I've had a client that got hyper chisel on my program, got pretty damn strong and then got caught up in, in, um, in doing a, a big bulk up to 210, 215. And end of the day, he cut back right to where he was before with the freaking same strength. Um, and, uh, and so I think like the state, like if your goal is to look amazing at 10%, yeah, get as strong as possible and maybe let yourself go up to 12%. But I just don't think there that, that if you, if you want to look at really, really good lean, it, it's counterproductive to let your body fat go to the point where you have to cut 10 pounds of fat after you end up at the same spot. Um, and now I will say there, like, for like, I will say that, yeah, I can build strength, um, better when my body fat is, you know, maybe closer to like on a more, more on the higher end of single digits. When I get to the point where freaking my face is gaunt and, uh, you know, I'm just like, you know, I'm like way leaner then the strength is way harder. So yeah, like there's a sweet spot and everyone has to find their sweet spot. I mean, if we're going to say that my body fat is seven to nine percent. Um, yeah, if I'm at eight to nine percent, it's easier. If I'm down to seven or below, it's way harder. So, so that's a caveat. And that's with me and my genetics, someone else might be more sensitive to leanness where they do best 10 to 12%, but, um, no one needs to get to 16, 17%. If they want to look as good as possible, lean at 10%. That's my, that's, that's my belief. This is a good segue into talking about your testosterone levels and how you maintain good looking levels while being sub 10% because most people think it's like a physical impossibility essentially. But first, before we talk about that, staying this lane, obviously a task and is like, you know, a, I don't know, um, speaks to the effectiveness of your diet model, what you've been doing and adhering to this whole time and like your programs and whatnot. So if you're only lifting three times a week and you don't really do like allocated cardio sessions necessarily, as far as I know, like, do you like, like a militant fucking structure, make sure you get 10,000 steps a day or what is your energy expenditure modality of choice? You just go for long walks or is it more diet driven through a deficit? Yeah. If I'm just, ma- if I'm just maintaining my body weight, I can literally do no exercise. I can just do my three lifts and sit down all day, work all day, walk 4,000 steps and I can maintain my leanness. If I want to get consistently leaner, it definitely helps to get those 10,000 steps in. Um, but I definitely found that for me, I've, I've done cardio, like I've done high amounts of training and gained weight and didn't lose any weight. And because my appetite would, would, would shoot up. And I, I've had periods where I was doing intense cardio, burning 800 calories or more and then, you know, I came home, I tried to be on my diet and, uh, I just couldn't stick to it. I get hungry. And at the end of the day, also, like if you, if your calories are already restricted, right, let's say you're someone's 180 pounds, they're eating 2,200 calories a day. Your calories are already restricted. If you add in too much exercise, um, it's not going to be like, if you go and do a hard running workout and if you burn 800 calories, it's not like your metabolism, your maintenance, um, the amount of calories you, you, you burn that day is 800 calories higher your body will compensate. And this is way stronger when your calories are already reduced. If you're eating as much as you want, there's less compensation, but when your calories are reduced and you jack up your energy expenditure, well, now you're lazier. Now you're lying on the couch. Now you're not having sex as good. You're putting less energy in the bedroom and all these things. You have literally, if you're awake for 16, 17 hours a day, that's 16, 17 hours a day to burn calories. And if you, and if your calories are reduced and you're doing a hard cardio, you're lazier and you can serve. And I found that the most powerful way to lose fat effortlessly is through neat non-exercise activity thermogenesis. If I'm talking here and I'm moving my hands and I'm, I'm shuffling around, I'm burning more than just the person just sitting here. Da, 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 da. Like I, and I, I've learned if you can kind of master the, the neat and you know, you're on a business call, you're walking around, you're doing this and that it's a lot easier. Um, it's a lot easier to stay lean. 
And you know, if if you look at some research, they they'll they'll overfeed someone by a thousand calories a day, and you know, some people will gain loads of fat. They'll gain seven eight pounds of fat that month, and some people will gain two pounds. Mm. And it 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 and it's 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 that that neat response. If you can, and I think you can train it. Um, I I literally think you can train it. But I get my leanest. Like I've. I love doing boxing training and stuff like that, but but I get my leanest when I cut out cut out all that crap. Like I cut mm. it out. I just do my lifts and I, and I just walk and focus on neat. But then when I do all the boxing stuff, my body, the more training you do, especially like at a certain intensity, the more food and calories and re- replenishment you want. And maybe you could theoretically just add the perfect amount of extra calories to, to, to handle that. But I just found it very hard in, in, in practice to do that. And, and when you have to add in food calories, it's really easy to go over. So I get my, every time I've gone into my absolute leanest, full blown lower ab veins, face, like very chiseled. It was literally just uh, three shorter, 40, 40 minute lifts per week, walking, nothing else except for just daily random movements. Um, and, uh, and you want that to happen. You, you it, it's a very good thing because a lot of times the athlete that, that, that gets injured, that works out all the time, and then they're injured. Then when they're not moving around, they pack on 20, 30 pounds in a few months. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas like, you know, I, I find it eat like if I, if I have to if I'm you know, and, and again, people literally, you can test this with yourself. If you're ever sick for a week, you usually lose four or five pounds. You don't move at all. Mm-hmm. It's all, it's all like. 60 70% of the calories you burn is is your is your basically your resting metabolic rate. So 70% of the energy you're going to burn anyway is literally just lying down. So yeah, right. like get your lifts in, walk around. Um but but exercise is is a is a small bucket. It's cardio is not as big of a bucket as far as fat loss and getting lean and it is not like one like burn 800 calories now you're 800 like 800 calories more. It just it's it's a lot of that kind of just uh, a lot of that goes out the window. Um, and uh, it's, it's nutrition. That's why I'm, I'm diligent with my fasting. I'll eat 22, 2400 calories, make it really enjoyable and, uh, and I'll get leaner. And, and I get my leanest when I eat the same thing every day. Um, I do notice it's so much easier to get lean when I'm cooking. I like to eat out a lot, but eating out a lot, it's so much harder to like, you get the exact same meal at a restaurant and they find a way to add 400 calories to it. Mm. Um, whereas you make right. it, it, it's way, it's way easier. Um, and, uh, and you know, that's sort of how I stay lean. I understand the question about like, um, it's, it's two contrarian things trying to get very, very strong and having a lot of muscle and then also, you know, being very, very lean. Um, and that's like, literally that's, you know, what, you know, we all strive for. How do we get as, as, as whole, as much muscle and strength as possible and get that body fat levels down and I found that when that's the goal, having good strength and muscle with a low body fat, it benefits you to drop the training volume down. If I yeah. can, you know, and, and I, you know, some of the guys that do a lot of more training volume, they'll hold 15, 16% body fat plus most of the year. And they're eating a lot and they can go in the gym, spend more time. But if you're trying to stay under 10% year round, the volume's low. Um, you know, uh, Martin Burkan freaking hates me. But I mean, he's someone where he, he keeps his, he, when he stays lean, he's, his volume his volume's low, his yeah. volume's low. Um, but some of these, these leaner guys are, are and again, but again, you know, at the end of the day, you know, you got to test things out yourself um, and see what works for you. Um, but uh, so when you're man. trying to get like when somebody plateaus in weight loss and they're eating like 2,300 calories or something really low, you know, like ultimately it's likely that their meat has just decreased so much because they're just like lazy as fuck and not doing anything or moving around and making like fidgets and movements and stuff. At that point, when you recommend like going back to maintenance calories, is that the goal of it to provide the fuel to then not only fix the leptin ghrelin dysregulation for appetite, you know, feedback mechanisms, but also for making sure they're starting to like move properly again and expend calories at a maximum amount, even at rest and then start to pull the calories back down. Yeah. Yeah. This is like, I have very simple um, responses to any sort of pe- per- person in my program, a client, what to do. Um, and, you know, I think appetite is the most useful tool. If someone is again, doing a 400 calorie deficit 
and they're ravenous, they're starving. That to me is the best feedback possible where go up to, go up to maintenance, bump your, if, if 300 calories, maybe it's not even maintenance, maybe it's 300 calories does the trick, or maybe it's 600. Um, I, I am a firm believer that cutting and getting lean, even when you want to get very lean, even if you want to get 70% should never feel brutal or hard. That's mm. always been, and this is how I kind of came up with my approach. My belief was like, I cannot suffer. I cannot starve. I can push myself hard. I can handle stress, but nothing is harder than starving because that's 24 freaking seven. If you have yeah. cravings and hunger, like I, you know, you can crush an insane workout or put yourself through something militant, but hunger and appetite is the hardest thing. It, it literally, I don't think people understand how hard it is to diet, yeah. especially yeah. when that diet it's, it's 24 seven. And that willpower you have, it, it breaks down. It, it's limited. Um, and so if someone's genuinely hungry, I'm like, go to maintenance. No, not the time to cut. Um, that said, most of the times, if you structure the nutrition plan right, if you, you know, fast and now you can eat pretty big meals, not fast too long, but just a short, smooth fast, um, it gets a lot easier. Um, but, but, but one of the big issues that I see with people um, having issues getting to a low body fat and having hormonal issues with low body fat is one, they try and diet too quickly. They want to, they have like this firm deadline they want to be ripped for. And they, they stay in a very prolonged deficit. Um, and, and they have issues when they're in a constant deficit, they're training way too much on that calorie deficit. They're doing two a days. They're doing too much exercise, too much cortisol, too much stress with already reduced calories. And they have issues. I found completely that doing very high protein diets when calories are restricted and you have to pull from fats or carbs and now your carb intake is very low, or now your fat intake is 50 grams a day is I found as a natural compare worst thing you can do for your hormonal levels. Um, I used, I literally had periods where I was dieting and I never woke up with a boner ever. And then I've had <laughs> yeah. I've, ever, yeah. and I've, I've had periods where I've been so lean and I woke up and my sex drive was very high, this and that no issues. But I, you know, I kept my protein at 140 grams, maybe 150 max. And I ate lots of potatoes and with olive oil. And I just, I hit 23, 2400 calories, but I got the fats and carbs in. And mm -hmm. my body, and you know, again, I, again, I, I think everyone should test it up for themselves because some people seem to do well on low carbs, but I was so sensitive to having my carbs down. When I did 120 grams of carbs a day, was not the same person. Um, I keep my fats fairly high, probably 90 grams. I, I'm not super high carb. I don't love, I'm, I don't do the crazy high carbs, but I'll have, you know, 200 and, you know, what if I'm have 160 pounds of lean body mass or whatever it is, you know, 1.5 grams per pound of lean body, 240 grams is all I need. And I'm, I'm I like doing, I like doing the low end of protein. Um, yeah. So what I would speculate, and I think maybe this would benefit a lot of naturals who otherwise can't, like I'm a, maintaining sub 10% year round for most people. I don't necessarily think it's conducive for everyone. Like it seems like you are a bit of an outlier in that aspect, but I do think there's a few things you do that probably allow you to get away with it more than the average person. And that's your fatigue accumulation through the week is low or than a normal person who's doing shit tons of cardio, working out four to five days a week. So you have that kind of like recovery capacity to support holding your hormones essentially or holding the production of them at a higher level in addition to that you mentioned the carbohydrate intake and fat intake that goes against like what everyone thinks is at least a gram per pound of body weight of protein and then decrease either they strip out all fat and they end up with like a low fat diet which obviously is going to fuck up your hormone production or they strip out carbs which is going to prevent there's something called SHBG, which is kind of like dictating of your free testosterone levels. So ultimately, if you're pulling out all your carbs and you have like very low, um, like uh, insulogenic cascades that lead to SHBG going to like female territory, you could have like a normal looking total T, but like crash free test and end up with not being able to get a boner, not being able to, you know, your sex drive shit ability to pack on muscles low. So there's like definitely something to be said about actually getting, even if you're in a deficit, a balanced amount of fat, protein, carbs. Because once you strip too hard from either of these categories, like you start to really fuck with your body's ability to maintain any level of homeostasis. So I think that those two things, like the balanced diet, even though it's in a deficit, 
plus the low fatigue seems to be able to maintain you at like a normal level is like what I speculate. A hundred percent. Because um, even when I was in my, you know, lo- early twenties, I tested it. Every single person in the fitness industry was pushing a high amount of protein. Um, I learned quite a bit from Martin Burkhan. Guy is super smart. I'll give credit where credit's due. He was pushing like on a guy my size, 260 grams of protein. Jesus. That when you're cal- yeah, 260 grams, because he loved how filling it was or whatever. And I kind of learned, someone said this, I forget who said this, but protein is the most filling macronutrient until it's not. So one, <laughs> like if, if you only have 80 grams of protein a day, you're going to be starving. Yeah. But if you have that big steak, you have that, that omelet and you get that, the protein needs met, even have essential amino acids or whatever, um, you will get, for me at least, you'll get more satiated from having potatoes, crispy yeah. potatoes, than just eating more meat because then your my, my brain will be like, I, I have carb cravings. I have this. Um, so everyone was pushing the high protein thing and I did it. And I never I never really tested my test. I never got my testosterone levels checked when I was doing low carb stuff. Um, but but I just, you know, I started to realize, yes, of course, fat is very important for testosterone function. I think that one of the underrated things is what you said. I didn't even, I didn't even know about that process about, um, about low carb. Um, yeah. Like, guys who do keto, like there's guys who do carnivore diet. I'm sure you've heard of that. And yeah. guys who do keto all the time, their SHBG literally is like higher than a girl. So they're wow. free, or it's in female territory. So it's like their total test might be like 600, but their free test is like fucking five. Jesus. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I did. I did see one piece of research where it was looking at fat calories and fat was the same. And then they played around with protein and carb intake. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, one of the, one, like one was higher protein, whereas like less carbs were like, there's less carbs than protein. Yeah. And then the other one was like 1.5 grams of carbs per pound of pro- protein. So if you have like 150 protein, like 225 carb, I'm pretty sure it's 1.5. And the, the testosterone difference, I think they're looking at total testosterone was 30%. Yeah. So same calories, same fat, but a, a 30% difference in testosterone um, by eating more carbs and less protein. Mm-hmm. And so I've always, you know, I've always kind of realized that, you know, if you're going to stay natural and you're going to keep your calories modulated, that hit the low end of protein, you know, for someone that's 180, 140 grams of protein, maybe 150. Um, you can probably do okay at a gram per pound. Like you can probably make that work if your deficit's not too small, but if you're trying to go above that, if you're trying to do 200, 250, it, 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 it the sex drive catapult, like, or not catapults, it, it collapses. Yeah. Um, and you know, I, I kind of, I kind of tested that out, out for myself. And then once I put in the carbs and the fats back and drop my protein down, um, then, then, uh, I woke up and it was like fucking morning wood. Everything was fucking life was good again. Yeah. You know, I started laughing when I watched comedies, when my carbs were too low, I, I my yeah. serotonin was down. I couldn't laugh. You oh, know? Yeah. So, yeah. That fucks up your sleep too. When you have low carb, please. your serotonin is like, like bottomed. Like you can't even like relax and get into like a parasympathetic state. You're like perpetually redlined almost. And you're like, body's just craving fucking sugar and you can't get relaxed at nighttime. Like a big carb meal can be crucial for all of those things. Hundred percent. And last story, last thing I'll say on this whole maintaining a, a decent hormonal level uh, lean is that you can just cut fairly strict to twelve percent, eleven percent, maybe ten percent. But when you're playing under the single digits, you have to listen to your body. And this is what no one really talks about um, because people just want to get to five, six percent for a show. So you can't really take a few weeks off if you have a show. But it, listening to your body is so so important. It's live. If 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 anyone wants to get very lean, this is going to be the most value you ever get about getting very very lean. It's literally like surfing a wave. Okay. Like this is what it feels like. Maybe you're 10%, maybe you're 11%. And you know, sometimes we'll spend a month just eating at maintenance. I'm like, I'm, I want to cut, I want to get leaner, but the time's not now. Like it's just, I can feel it. It's like time's not now I'm hungrier. And then I'll have a few days and I'll just, I'll, I'll lock in and a few days, and my appetite's down 2200 calories is easy. And like, I'm riding that wave and I might ride it for two months, get very, very lean. And then all of a sudden, like my body wants food again. And then I'll listen to it and I'll eat a bit more. And then I'll, maybe my weight will come up a couple pounds. Um, but the, listening to your body is so valuable. When I used to try and push through and fight against it, there's a time to use willpower. But when you're talking about like getting very, very lean, staying under 10% body fat, you have to like, 
You have to listen to your body. If, if you have a day where you're just ravenous, you're hungry, there's no benefit for pushing through. If it's like real ravenous hunger, there's zero benefit from pushing through. You're just going to use willpower and then you're going to, it's going to collapse. And then you're going to have a bigger binge eat. You're better off just being like, okay, let me add 400 calories today. And let me kind of get back on tomorrow. Um, it's so important. It's not as important when you're 14, 15% body fat because leptin levels are, are usually fine, but under 10%, it's, 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 it made such a big difference. And so literally a lot of times I get my absolute leanest. I'm like, I want to cut, but I'm like, I'm just waiting. I'm, I'm eating a bit more. My appetite's just kind of not there. And then I get like that. And then all of a sudden, like, you know, I, I, maybe I don't eat out at restaurants as much. I, I kind of cook a bit and I get a few good days in my belt and I feel I like, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling the deficit and I just, I, I, get, I cut fat. It's like, it's uh, but it, I can't do it all the time. That's why yeah. I, if someone put a gun to my head and said, you have a, a fitness show, you have to be 6% this day. I, cu I couldn't do it. I don't know. We'll yeah. see. It's weird. Like I just, it just happens, you know? Hmm. Yeah. I think a lot of uh, anabolics users, they get away with, like, there's a lot of stuff they can get away with that natural simply can't when it comes to like above and beyond, you know, upregulation of like anabolic activity at the androgen receptor and stuff like the actual fat that fuels the you know hormonal synthesis and whatnot like if you have a zero fat diet as a bodybuilder is on gear like it you are exogenously pinning it into your ass it doesn't matter if your fat is zero for at least the hormone production side of things and when your carbs are low you know like your shbg being sky high is not as problematic because you're on androgens and those manually lower the shbg too so you get away with a lot of things and i think it leads to bad diet advice and this is where we see a lot of like chicken broccoli fucking recommendations and crash dieting and stuff coming from guys who use anabolics telling guys who are natural potentially like this is how i get ready for a show like this is what you got to do to get lean and then you end up with naturals or even the guys on gear too they have fucked up hormones they just don't see it because they just look at testosterone levels and that's like the only thing they care about but like thyroid's all dysregulated like all these things are off but having like the balanced approach is definitely the way to go. I don't necessarily know that everyone can maintain, you know, 500 total test or whatever, when they are doing a deep deficit, having the balanced model, but it's still certainly a fuck ton better than what a lot of people are doing, which is just like chicken breast, broccoli, crash diet, and that's fucking it. And they end up with crash thyroid, crash testosterone, sky high SHBG, like disproportionately even lower free testosterone. They end up like hating life. And it's just not sustainable at all whatsoever so 100 just out of curiosity what, what what kind of macros do you kind of gravitate towards as far as carbs fats protein um for me it is usually like body weight protein yeah. and the fat content i don't even count it to be honest a lot of it comes from the meat and um like random things here and there and then it's kind of just like filled with carbs i'm honestly not very strict like I yeah. should, like I'm, I'm, no, I'm not. I, I used to track my macros meticulously, and I I, I burn out. I, I wasn't as my adherence was lower. Now I just hit calories and protein, and just kind of and just I don't avoid fat. I don't avoid carbs. I welcome them within mm -hmm. reason. I don't eat like crazy like fat like ground beef. I'll do leaner cuts of steak, but I I just I welcome fat, welcome carbs, and just hit my protein and calories, and then it's yeah. so much easier. Yeah, my calories are around like 3,000 to 3,200, but realistically for the amount of activity I'm doing, that's too high. Like I sit in an office like a lot of the time. The problem is, is my fucking kitchen is like right there. So like I used to be in university walking around all the time. I'd go like a lifeguard or then I was a bouncer or this or that, as well as the gym, as well as like dating life. And it was like, you didn't have the ability to just like eat because you didn't have the time to. But when it's like right there, it becomes a bit easier to fall off. So that's like my weakness personally, but obviously ultimately having a, like for you, do you have a calorie range that you stick between for adhering to your eight to 10%? Yeah. So, I mean, on my lower end, I'll do 2,200 to 2,300. And that's when mm -hmm. I'm generally, I'm getting, you know, three pounds leaner a month, maybe four. Um, and then I'll let myself go up to you know, 3,200. I never, I don't really eat much over 3,200 ever. I just find that if I'm fasting, because every day I'll fast, my first meal is not a big meal. I'll eat 600 calories or, or you know, something like that. I, I, I like to save the appetite for the big feast. So like, it's hard to eat 4,000 calories if you only really have one big substantial meal and some dessert. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, if I'm, if I'm having my, if I've had 700 calories and I'm going into my big dinner at eight o'clock, like, 
am I going to really eat like another like four or 3000 calories? It's going to be very difficult. So yeah. I, I just try and, and that's the cool thing with the, my approach that I do. It's that, you know, you can get leaner pretty easily. Um, but even if you kind of fuck up a bit, you don't really gain weight. You kind of just end up falling right at maintenance. Mm. So if I'm just like, you know, if I, if I eat a ton, I'll, I'll probably just fall close to maintenance. Um, but I also have a massive appetite where I can eat. Like if I want to, eat, like, if I was like, I don't care at all, I could go to, out to dinner and have two or three entrees and, and, mm. and dessert. I could do it. I wouldn't like need, I'm not hungry to do it, but I could, I could do it if I wanted to. When I used to binge eat, cause I was, I would do low carb. I'd be strict for four or five days. I had days where I would eat like, I don't know how much I ate because I didn't calculate it, but like if I had to guess seven, 8,000 calories, but like it didn't feel good. Like I felt like yeah. I did it out of guilt and shame. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm usually around 22, 2300. And then, you know, yeah, 2600 20 to 2800, I'll probably stay at maintenance and, and maybe, you know, maybe my weight will creep up if I start falling up to 3000, 3200, my, yeah, 3000, 3200, my weight will come up. And it, you know, what's weird, man, that like, it's hard to like, sometimes it, 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 it like the, on paper, I should only gain weight this fast, but it sometimes just comes on faster. And sometimes on paper, I should only lean down this quickly. And it just, sometimes just things, things can be a little, uh, you know, like when I'm like, I've, I've, you know, I can put on weight really easily. Like, mm. like I can, I could, if I wanted to be 190, like I, I, I you couldn't give me a deadline to be 6% body fat, but you could give me a freaking deadline to be 200 pounds. <laughs> I could do it. Yeah. I could, I could probably, if I'm 179, I could, I don't want to create a challenge when people ask me to do it. Cause I yeah. have zero interest in having to cut 20 pounds of fat after. Mm. Um, but I, I could, I could, uh, I could hit, you know, I could put on 20 pounds in a month easily and it wouldn't even be hard. One thing it'd be, fat. it'd be body fat. Yeah. Yeah. Before we get into like the actual blood test results, one thing I wanted to ask you is over the years, more and more, like when you first started dieting, a lot of these like zero sugar, low calorie alternative type foods that aren't even really foods existed. Like a lot of the zero calorie syrups, the condiments, the this, the that, that kind of stuff has been more pre prevalent nowadays. Whereas back in the day, it was like, oh, you have chicken, put like fucking mustard or hot sauce on it. And that was like your two options, essentially. Have you found any difference in satiety or, I don't know, temptation to eat having, I don't even know if your diet consists of this, but having things with like artificial sweeteners in it versus not um, having like diet. Like I know you have the sparkling water, coffee, but have you ever tried to have like I don't know, like the diet type foods that they sell, like the low carb shit or anything like that and found it fucks with your gut microbiome and like causes weird cravings or anything. Like I've always been curious about the science behind people who use like tons of like Walden farm syrup and like protein bars and this and that. And if it actually like fucks with their like gut brain axis. Yeah, it's weird. I mean, I, I, I've, I, I mean, at one time I, was, I had a protein, like a casein protein years and years and years ago that had aspartame or something and, and and i'd eat it and i just had cravings after it, that mm. one fucked with me some don't um but i generally speaking i i don't uh do any of those like super like low calorie diet alternatives i find like maybe it works for a period of time but then your brain just figures it out and it doesn't do much mm. like like I, i've like i'll have a quest bar here and there if like i'm, I'm if i'm traveling i'm hungry and I'm, I'm, i want to like have a quest bar i find that it's pretty decent yeah. um but but um i don't mess around with any of those lower carb things i just find like at the end of the day if you want to get very very lean you just got to make the you got to just you know there's not really any crazy shortcuts unfortunately you know so i just structure my diet where i can i i fast i i eat a smaller medium-sized first meal and i have an awesome feast and and the the foods that do the best for me are like the like you know freaking grandma's cooking like you know, potatoes and, and like, and, and steaks. And if I try and if I have foods that are too low fat, then I will be hungry 20 minutes later. Hmm. Um, so I, I kind of just, I, because I fast, I eat like just a couple meals. I actually like, like to get foods that are pretty substantial. Like I don't need to like, you know, I can have a 1300 calorie feast. Um, so I don't, I don't play around with the Walden farms, maple syrup. I generally prefer for the most of like you know, I'm not perfect, but most of the time I prefer to avoid artificial sweeteners. Yeah. Um, I, I like, I pretty much like, you know, I, uh, I pretty much avoid them altogether. Do you find, do you find, did you find it mess with your microbiome? 
Um, yeah, I don't know. It's kind of hard to say because my lifestyle has transitioned more sedentary over the years. So I think most of it is just proximity to food and lack of doing stuff outside of the office that has been more of a problem than anything. So it's kind of hard to say for certain, but it's definitely my willpower seemingly has diminished over the years where at like when I was in university, I would literally like adhere to 2300 calories plus cardio plus go to all my classes full time, then go work, then go date. And when I think about that now, like people see how much work I do and they're like, wow, like you're so productive. And I'm like, I think back to that. And I'm like, I was way more productive back when I was like in my early 20s. Personally, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. What, what do you think that difference is? Um, I think mainly it was just, I had to fucking do those things versus yeah. now when you're an entrepreneur, your limit on like back then there was like cemented concrete goals, like do this class get this grade, go to work get this paycheck. And you have a certain amount of scheduled shifts, go, you know, talk to this chick, you know, go on a date with her, you know, do whatever that sort of thing. Like there was cemented, like concrete things that had to be done. Versus now my business is basically bottlenecked by there's no concrete anything like I have to set my own deadlines or else they don't exist. So I could like sit here and do fucking nothing for a month. And the only detriments would be my business would grow slower, not that something would implode, not that anything would go wrong, because like I'm in a good position where I could hypothetically just fucking sit here. So for me, I think it was more so that I had so many things I had to do. And I felt like completely obligated to get those done or else I wouldn't get like, uh, I don't know, like I paid a shit ton for university. Like I'm going to go to class. I'm going to like complete the exam. I'm going to do this. You know what? This is really, really good advice. I think the smartest thing a man could do. How old are you, by the way? 29. 29. Okay, I'm 30. I'm basically the same age. I think the smartest thing a man can do is... Quick note from one of our sponsors. This is Seed Symbiotic, the daily pre- and probiotic that I use, Symbiotic, that has 24 clinically and scientifically studied strains. And the reason why I use it, I could go into like the big marketing spiel, but like realistically, I'm sure you guys would rather hear my anecdotes of why I use it um, and what benefit I see from it. So for me, I'm always trying to optimize in all aspects, you know, mental clarity, sharpness, cognitive flexibility, memory formation, as well as like actual just straight up systemic health. And for me, I was seeing a lot of literature coming out suggesting that the gut microbiome had very, very strong interactions with satiety signaling, um, autoimmune disease, uh, mental health. And when I say mental health, I don't just mean from like an emotional um, stability context and mood regulation, but as well from like an actual fucking clarity and sharpness context. So for me, obviously, you know, eking out as much sharpness and clarity I can get, mental acuity for my day to day work, which is quite demanding, is high priority. So obviously foundational principles, diet, lifestyle, circadian rhythm, high quality sleep, all the main backbones. But for me, any additional benefit I can get, you know, I'm up for it. So for me, I was looking into probiotics to support my gut microbiome. I had tried a bunch of different ones off iHerb and Amazon, but frankly, I was just kind of like picking random shit that looked good, had a lot of reviews, seemed to be good. You know, the strains seemed consistent across different companies. It was kind of just like, it's such a weird, obscure area of research that I was kind of just like taking shots in the dark. And then for me, um, I saw the owner talking about this product on a podcast a few years ago now, and he had very convincing points. And he seemed to have a lot of literature to support his formulation, unlike a lot of the I heard products that I was buying at the time. And then in addition, there were some people that I became friends with that actually were using this themselves that I respected their opinion enough to kind of like push me over the edge of actually getting on this stuff. And it was fortunate because they started shipping to Canada because when I first looked into it, they did not. So now they do ship um, to Canada as well as um, the UK, I believe as well, whereas prior they did not. And for me, this is like, my insurance policy of sorts, essentially. It is something that, uh, I don't know how much it moves the needle in a significant context, but for me, any kind of additional systemic benefits I can get from a health aspect, longevity aspect, quality of life aspect, especially mental clarity aspect, um, an overall gut health support aspect that was like, you know, my, my justification at the time, and I found it worthwhile to spend my money on at the time too. Fortunately, they've since sponsored the podcast, which is pretty fucking cool considering I was already um, interested in this product to begin with. 
Um, and they've been one of the biggest supporters of the content here. So if you want to support me and support them, which indirectly supports me because they, you know, put their neck out to support their videos, my videos, and, you know, integrate them into my videos. Um, you guys supporting products that I feature on the channel and these integrations, highly appreciated because um, it helps feed into the growth of the channel. So if you want to support me as well as try it for yourself, um, you can get 15% off your first month's supply of Seeds Daily Symbiotic, clicking the link in the video description below and using code Derek at checkout. And back to our regularly scheduled programming. When you're 18, 19, 20, 18 to 25, do not fucking party. Like here and there, yes. <laughs> here and there, yeah. But guys do it completely wrong. They, mm. they waste all that energy and youthfulness and exuberance on partying when they're broke. Mm. And then when they're 26, they stop. Yeah. And, and then, you know, if they, if you flip the script, if you just focus on, if you find a, a, a mechanism to really to, to do, you know, for you, it's been YouTube and then launching your businesses. For me, it's been something quite similar, but if you find a mechanism, like, like be hyper-focused in your early twenties. And cause I, I had that similar experience as you where I, you know, and then, uh, and then, you know, when, well, now you can like, if you, if you take a step back, things are moving, you're just growing slower. If then that's the time to like, you know, have fun and, and party. So I think, I think, uh, you know, I'll, I'll say this right now, like the way society is moving makes it a lot easier for you and me to, to compete when, mm -hmm. when, when most guys in their early twenties are just partying and getting drunk and, and getting, you know, useless university degrees. And then, you know, and, and again, it's, it's easier to, as a man, it's easier to be broke and not have money to spend when you're, you know, 22, when you're 30, you don't yeah. want to have to like not spend work. any money. Yeah. Yeah. Like if I could, sometimes I am kind of, uh, pissed when I think back to the amount of time I wasted in university, going to these classes, doing all these things that weren't like, I got a business degree and it was not actually useful whatsoever to marketing, even though it was yeah. a degree in marketing, it was not useful in any capacity. Cause ultimately your professors are just like, people who got degrees in marketing who are now teaching marketing, not people who've actually like built successful businesses. So like in hindsight, if I started what I was doing in my earlier to mid twenties, if I started at like fucking 18 or 19 and didn't go to university at all, I'm like, damn, like maybe I could be where I am now, like at 24 or 25. You could have had four years of partying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah. at the same time, it's kind of interesting though. Cause like, I don't think, I think a lot of people have a misguided idea or perception of what is a resourceful use of time to like get chicks or something like going to the club and like blowing money on drinks like the amount of time it even takes to go plan a night like go from your house to downtown like wherever you are like vancouver toronto or something the logistics of getting a chick back from that club hypothetically all the way to your place like 30 minutes away or something and spending all night at this club and fucking up your sleep that's going to ruin your next day too. Like, I don't know, like, I guess Tinder and stuff didn't exist when I was first getting into like the dating life, but like nowadays there are so much more time efficient, resourceful and smart ways to go about even like sp speed tracking your dating life too, that it just like makes, I don't know. It's just like baffling to me that people still go do the whole like club scene in their early twenties when they have like no money or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. I think you can. Yeah. If, if you're, if, cause I, I've seen my peers, I don't know if I, everyone else's peers or their experiences are different, but like the culture of drinking where I'm from, it's like, yeah, 20 year old, they're going out two, three days a week, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or th Friday, Saturday, they're going like, they're spending money that they shouldn't spend, you know, mm. Uber here, um, 80 bucks at the ball. Like they're spending a lot. And then like, I think that the smartest thing to do, if, if you, if you're a long-term thinker, I'm a long-term thinker, I'm, I'm, I'm focused on my goals. I want to, I, I don't want to like, I don't want instant gratification. I want to sacrifice now to, to get somewhere else. So if you're, if you're a long-term thinker, it makes sense to put that energy into your business. And the, one of the other big costs is yeah, money, time, uh, logistics, all these things. Um, but the other big cost is like, you know, I didn't notice this when I was younger, but like, if you, if you are one kind of big day of drinking can just affect your next day and you know and and just your it slows you down you, you might not notice it that day but like you know if, if you're getting hammered once a week or twice a week if you're getting drunk once or twice a week yeah the yeah. difference in, in in success you experience is it, it, it just changes it you know the guy that gets drunk kind of just stays the same makes maybe some little improvement 
yeah. kind of just maintains the same. Whereas a guy that's, that does it like when I was on my biggest growth curve, I, I would drink, but like just maybe two or three drinks and I'd stop. And then I was essentially sober. Um, but, but you know, the guy that that's kind of sharp kind of just makes that, that, that just consistent improvement as opposed to, you know, one step back gets hung over here. It really affects you. I've seen some, ext- I mean, I'm not perfect. I do drink, but I've seen some very, very successful people and, 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 if they're on the up and up, just not they, like they're not just coasting. They're on the up and up. They 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 don't talk about it. They don't. No, drink. They don't it like it. impacts. I think your success accumulation so dramatically if you waste money on that stuff early too. Because it's like when you yeah. first start building a business, like the ability to hire an editor or to hire a marketing, I don't know, somebody who does ads for you, or to be able to hire a designer or to do anything. Every dollar like hits. And it fucking hurts when you're that poor. So it's like yeah. if you're spending one week like out buying drinks at an expensive club, Ubering because you can't drink and drive, obviously, all of these different things like that eats into your resources like so much more proportionally than if you've built up wealth and then you do those things. So it's like now I never believe in the whole like, except when you start the saving yeah. and yeah. like being chintzy as fuck with your money. Like now I love the opportunity to be able to, if I go out, like I don't think about a meal. I don't think about drinks. I don't think about fucking Uber, Ubering a girl to and from my place. Like none of that stuff like impacts my concern of how much money is able to be allocated to business opportunities. But when you were like starting for the first like one, two years, like one night out can like not only fuck up your like mental resources and ability to be productive and have like that's one day out the window too potentially of as well as a week of gains maybe if you get hammered i don't know like how dramatic that is but it's like hits you in many ways but like that 300 bucks or 200 bucks or 100 bucks like whatever it is like really eats into whatever like tiny little fucking margin you had to work with to work on your side hustle that you hope one day turns into an actual business for sure. Yeah. No, honestly, yeah, it's, it's a mass. And, and then some guys, they, or, you know, they'll, they'll spend money that, you know, they'll, uh, they'll have no freaking savings. And then they, they, like, it's, it's, it's a, it's a mentality thing. It's literally a mentality thing. Like, you know, if my income was 10% of what I make now or, 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 or 10 times it, or, 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 you know, it's, it's even when I was making very little, like, I just liked seeing my bank account go up. I like the security of seeing, you know, that, that comfort in my bank account. Some people have the opposite. They make more money and they spend it. And so yeah. if you if you want to make a good business decision, you have to have like, yeah, the, you have to be sitting on the right amount of money. And if, and if all, and now, if you have to make a certain decision because you don't have enough money because you, you know, so, but yeah, like the goal is to like get out of that mode as fast as possible. Like, you know, yeah. use your time energy wisely, especially in your twenties. Don't put that career, that extra energy into just partying. I waited to part until I was 25 to party mostly. Um, but yeah, no, it makes a, it makes a huge difference. Like subconsciously, your tolerance to risk is so much lower too. If you're constantly like just constant bank account and you don't see it like escalating at all, like you don't feel the like big decisions at every point of like an entrepreneur's career, there's like some point where you have to put in more money than you're comfortable with to do something at yeah. some point to like make that next leap in your business progression and your ability to do that leap, like whatever point it is, whether it's like 50 grand to buy like one third of a business or, you know, later down the line, like a million dollars to buy a fuck ton of inventory, those jumps, like you are not going to have the same tolerance to risk if you had those nights where you were constantly like burning like fucking 200 bucks. You know, what's interesting. This is something that not too many people talk about, but uh, success, you know, making a lot of money, achieving success, it's, it's rarely ever the most intelligent. Um, you know, a lot of times the most intelligent have actually low risk tolerance yeah. um, and they end up kind of taking the safer path and they don't really have the mechanism to make millions of dollars. Um, and a lot of times, you know, that's if, if you have a high above average IQ and, you know, you're, you know, focus on point, all of this and you can tolerate risk, um, that helps. My risk tolerance is almost too high. Yeah. I, I, my risk tolerance is, is, is pretty, pretty freaking high. Yeah. Um, and it's not like, oh, just from, you know, because my, my, my brothers are, 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 they're not as, as, as like risk taker as risk taker. I love, I love fucking taking risk, but yeah. I have to like, you know, you have to balance it out. But, um, I, 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 I'm, yeah, I like, you know, I like taking, taking risk, but yeah, like if, if you're not willing to handle any bit of risk because you don't plan and in order to do that, you have to, you have to like build yourself like a comfort and, and have that. But if, if you're not willing to, if you can't handle risk tolerance and you don't put yourself in a position to handle any risk tolerance, you're never going to be able to make 
real, real, real money. Yeah. Yeah. He's building gonna... up whatever that like everyone at some point has like their side hustle and like an actual job. Like everyone had like a normal full time job that paid some like, you know, maybe a good amount if you're lucky. But for me, it was like I never had a job that paid more than like 20 bucks an hour as a bouncer, as a lifeguard, as a like fucking golf course attendant, like all the different things I did. So for me, it was like taking leaps in business like back then spending like 10 grand was like fucking massive, you know, that kind of thing. Maybe I wouldn't have been able to enter into business opportunities at all if I was being stupid with my money and going on like extravagant, like nights out and shit like that. So mm -hmm. worthwhile to consider for, you know, the younger guys. Cause do you, do you think testosterone levels affect hugely dude? Yeah. <laughs> hugely. Like there is a, <laughs> I have a friend and he is, uh, his total testosterone is 1700 and he's natural. It's like a genetic anomaly. He has like a Jesus. like a weird dysfunction of his adrenal gland and like some other stuff. And like it actually his blood work is like the most weird thing to look at ever. I was like when I first saw it, he, how I met him actually was he wanted to run his blood work by me. And I was actually asking him about like, uh, you know, like tax structure in Canada and shit. We just had like an overlap of, you know, value exchange, essentially, we ended up being good friends. But his testosterone levels were like so fucking high and his approach to business and like building businesses, selling them, how successful he's been and the way he even behaves publicly and the way he like organizes like team gatherings and stuff. And like is always the head of just like such a convincing and uh, I don't know if like authoritative is the word necessarily, but just like such a clear, like dominant leader, like that kind of thing. It was I believe is definitely dictated by his like unique hormone profile. Like I would highly, I'd be highly skeptical that if he had a third of the testosterone levels that he would be behaving the same way. So damn, yeah, his like weird health condition kind of like worked in his favor. Shit. And that's, that's 1700. That's freaking. Yeah. I'm not saying everyone needs that. So don't go on yeah. TRT or something just to get that. But like, I definitely see a correlation between, and there, like scientific literature reinforces that testosterone like makes effort feel good. A lot of people have heard Andrew Huberman say that, and it's definitely reinforced in the literature. You, you know what's interesting about that? About that, you know, testosterone makes effort feel good. You know, yeah. When I was, I mean, when I was a teenager, I was freaking loved, like so drawn to training. Like you know, people like, how do you how do you get motivated to work out? How do you get motivated to work out? I was like, I don't get it. Like, how do you yeah. not love to work out? That said, I when your sleep is trash effort feels brutal yeah like when you're not you know when, when you're when you're sleep when you, you have like if i have a terrible sleep working out it feels like freaking you know it feels like you're freaking uh uh i will forget what the saying is it feels like you're uh freaking i don't know it feels like you're poking your eyes out it's just it's yeah. like you're just dragging well, ass you just don't want to be there at all yeah yeah do you track your sleep metrics at all? Like use an aura ring or anything like that? No, no, because I found that like, I, I definitely have had sleeping issues. The sleep hasn't been an easy thing for me um, because I'm on my phone constantly. I'm on social mm. media. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I'm so stimulated. I have to and, leave my phone out of the room now. And that was actually yeah. what fucked me up partially this morning is I couldn't, my thing, like, anyway, that's besides the point. But, but like for nope. me, I've had to like remove my phone from the like workspace just to focus even jesus yeah no yeah. my sleep has been uh like i have to have dead ass quiet i have like misophonia small noises will freaking i'll go insane small little chewing little ticks i have to like i can only really sleep at like freaking 65 degrees so does your girl ever have to not sleep in the same room oh uh no no she no she's 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 she sleeps dead quiet and she she handles the cold. She she likes okay. it cold actually. She likes mm -hmm. it cool. She's not she could do either or, yeah. but she prefers it like cold. So it work like some girls I've literally didn't work out because they couldn't handle the fucking sixty five degrees. <laughs> That's it, funny. It, 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 it's I, a lot I, of stuff you don't think of, but like actually is important. You know, I I've only dated a girl for more than like you know every girl I've dated like mostly they don't eat breakfast. They like to sleep in the cold. Mm -hmm. and you know they're yeah they're yeah but but so my sleep is something where and but the point is is like if i if i try and track my sleep it just the pressure stresses me out and i sleep worse so i try mm -hmm. not to like worry about it too much uh, um mm -hmm. I, I try and track certain variables but um like right now i'm sleeping good um there was a period where i would you know i was freaking like during the pandemic for example Everything was locked down in Toronto. It was freaking brutal. I was working on my business all day and like I couldn't have any sort of escapism. 
And so I, I, I found myself taking freaking edibles at night to shut down mm. and it, it worked like it was nice for a short period of time um, where I take like 25, 20, 25 milligram edibles. And then all of a sudden, you know, you've taken it for three, four weeks straight. And then now, now like your melatonin production has gone and now you, and now like you, you, you're I actually had full on like depression um, taking marijuana edibles daily. I don't think anyone really understands it, but it, it can freaking it uh it can be brutal. I did a video. It got suppressed by the algorithm because it was like had weed in the title or something, but it was like the effect of weed on sleep. It's like at first it seems to be like conducive by like helping you get to sleep, but it actually fucks up your REM sleep significantly. And it gets to a point where you're dependent on it, whereby you have like a rebound when you come off almost. And when you're on it, even it's like fucking up your sleep, even though you perceive that you're getting to sleep easier, your quality is like destructive. Yeah. Yeah. I've noticed this because like I, if I take edibles every day, I'll sleep good for the first th three, four days. When I was younger, I, I could go longer. And then after like seven days in a row, it, 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 like my baseline with marijuana is less than without it. So mm. actually when I did that hormonal test with you, um, I would, I did like a week taking, taking, uh, edibles. I, the only time I really take it was like my air conditioning wasn't working. I just freaking take an edible. I got caught up in taking it. And, uh, and you know, I, I definitely know. And Dan Bilzerian talked about this too, where he basically said like the very thing you use weed to fix, it exaggerates after like a, a long enough time. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, when I started taking edible, like marijuana edibles, I'd sleep amazing. And then all of a sudden I, I wouldn't sleep as well. And then, you know, to go off them, it's like three, four days of just really shitty sleep. And then, and then eventually you just feel better than ever. Um, but, but the one thing I noticed when I, when I, during the pandemic, when I, when I did take it consistently for a long time, um, was that, uh, dopamine levels were, were gone, dude. Like mm. I know the feeling of dopamine because that's something I was like literally blessed with as a kid. I just had so much dopamine. I just was so motivated to achieve my goals, to work out, to do this. My dopamine, I think my father must've had the same thing, but my dopamine levels were just, just nonstop. And I think, um, and, and, and we, like alcohol weed, obviously it releases it temporarily, but it depletes it doing uh, like my dopamine levels were, were, were so low. I couldn't even like, I was working on a new program and I, I couldn't even write it. And then I, then I, I got off that stuff, but, um, yeah, the pandemic, you know, pandemic, that was the, threw me off big time. Um, Where do you sleep most of the time? Like you have a condo in Toronto, right? And then you also like wherever a, you're at your parents' original place now family home. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So do you yeah. like have a preference for, like you said, there was like construction and shit that fucked up your sleep or something. Um, so when I did that test, I was in Miami. And so I was at the, oh, was at okay, my, right. my pad in Miami and, uh, and there's a, you know, it was overpriced condo, but yeah, they're doing a bunch of construction, of, uh, mm. uh, above me. And, uh, and again, like, here's the deal. Like I, you know, I made a, a plan to go get my, my, my blood work done on a certain day. And I just was like, nah, like, I, I don't want to just push it later. I want to like, I made the plan. I'm going to do it. And so, yeah, there's a lot of construction above me. I did get back. I was taking edibles that week and then to the point where it didn't even help me. And so I, I went to sleep at like, fell asleep at like 4.35 till seven. Um, so I had five, six, about two or three hours of sleep uh, going into the test. Okay. Um, and you know what? Like, I mean, we could go through the numbers, um, yeah, but, and, but also do you think mayor, what do you think the role, uh, weed would play on hormone? Um, there is some negative feedback through, I like, I'm pretty sure it increases. Do you know what aromatase is? It's like the enzyme that converts testosterone to estrogen, right? So yeah. If you increase the expression of that enzyme and you convert more testosterone to estrogen, you achieve like a physiologic amount of estrogen signaling faster because you have more estrogen being produced proportionally to your level of test. So you, and this is why fat people have lower test levels too, is because they have part of the reason, like they're metabolically unhealthy to begin with, but also more fat equals more estrogen conversion, which then signals to your brain, I have enough estrogen I don't need to make more testosterone to convert to estrogen because ultimately your brain's like signal of adequate amount of estrogen receptor activation is dictated by estrogen being produced. So if you have more estrogen relative to your testosterone, you're getting that signal quicker to your brain saying we don't need any more estrogen. So as a byproduct of that, make less testosterone. So right. the, the weed does seem to have some interaction with that. How significant is it though, if you're using it like sporadically once in a while, 
it seemed the literature is kind of unclear, but I would speculate that it would have like some suppressive effect potentially, but I wouldn't read into it like too much. Like I think no, sleep I, ultimately would be like the big one. Work. I've, and I've gained strength taking edibles every day. I've, I've built strength taking edibles every day. I've gotten very, very lean. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but the biggest thing was mental health on marijuana it goes to shit after a long enough period of time. Mm. Um, but so I'm, anyways, I'm, I'm, uh, I've kind of, I've, I've jumped in and back, back and forth in that stuff, but I'm, I'm freaking three weeks off, off freaking marijuana, which is, which is way better. Okay. I'm going to pull up the, let's see, I have the blood test here. So I think first we can probably look at, let me just make sure I have the right. So this one you sent me over Instagram today, that one is, um, from, let's see, ba, 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 ba. 2016 i think yeah so like at was this the most recent one other than no i have i haven't i have another test i did in uh in august august okay. september um it's i have it it just literally just has the total testosterone nothing else um it was you know i can i I gotta get that. It's in my MedCan freaking thing, but I forgot my password. If I email them to to uh, to basically give you the password, but I mean, I can share that number with you and and send you the, the screenshot of it um, if you want. But but basically, every except for this one, every testosterone test I've done has been within six hundred to six sixty. Okay, so I cut off the personal info on the top just in case, but just to verify for everyone, like this is his actual blood test. I just cropped off the top just in case there was like personal information on it that shouldn't be published on a video. So this was in 2016 and we had a luteinizing hormone of seven. So on the high end of normal DHA sulfate, like high adrenal production seemingly. So it seems like you're like... uh have good androgen production like a lot of people don't realize there's like trace androgens and all of the kind of like adrenal hormones that come from your adrenal gland are contributing as well so that looks like healthy functioning it's almost a little bit high i would almost be interested to see your cortisol but this is like a fucking six-year-old test so not no point in that but testosterone at 21.4 nanomoles per liter um let me convert that to nanograms per deciliter Animals per liter to nanograms for this. That one's 640 or 620. I forget. Right now on the screen share, can you only see this blood test still? Yeah. Okay. Just double checking. Okay. So 616. So, 616. Okay. Yeah. That looks pretty. Like, it seems like you're pretty consistent, like realistically. Like all the blood it's, tests I've seen from you are like, you know, 600 range, essentially. Yeah. Um, and then the estradiol at 90, we would have a 90 picomoles per liter to picograms per milliliter. Ba, ba, ba. We would have, so proportionally, you'd have a 24 picogram per milliliter estradiol. So like at a glance, if we were just to say, and this is the free testosterone. So a lot of people are going to get confused when they see this, because they see, okay, a free test, Oftentimes, you'll see a reference range that goes up to like 30. Here, we have up to 636. So this is a different method of calculation. Like here, you look at the unit. They have picomole per liter, whereas the blood test we're going to look at in a sec, which is the one you just got done, is a nanograms per deciliter. And the and reason... Is, go ahead. So I was going to ask you, is this the same standard of, of finding free testosterone? No. Yeah. So what they do, see how it says underneath it, free testosterone is estimated from measuring total testosterone and sex hormone binding globulin using an algorithm. So this is estimated based on this number right here, this 39 SHBG. So it's not actually like directly assessing the free test in your blood. Rather, it is assessing it based on a calculation between this and between this and kind of ballparking accordingly. So it's like a cheaper way to figure out your free T, but it's not necessarily accurate. So the gold standard is something called equilibrium dialysis, which is what we got done on your most recent test. And it's far more cost prohibitive, but it's the most accurate you could get. But I just want to like explain the reference ranges to people because they're going to see like this picomole per liter, 196 to 636. This is the reference ranges are going to be different between lab corp quest um presumably this test was done in canada i'm, I'm assuming or was uh, it, yeah 
Yeah. yeah so like strong. Canada uses different units of measurement too. So this is why you're going to see like, like this is not equivalent to why is it 490 versus like 25 on another test? Like this is, can be compared by converting the units, but ultimately be equilibrium dialysis nanogram per deciliter is what we want to see because your free test, your total test, we always look at what's the nanogram per deciliter total. That's what everyone's most familiar with between 250 to like a thousand. That's kind of like what everyone knows. So if we want to see what your free test is, like it just makes logical sense. The most accurate way to assess is like two to three percent or two to four percent in some cases is a free testosterone that is like proportionally proportional to your total test. And that's in the same unit of measurement, though. Like you would want to see the nanogram per deciliter free test that goes with your nanogram per deciliter total, not some weird, random, extrapolated picomole per liter free test. Have you yeah. seen a big difference in results if you do the conversion from that method of calculating free testosterone versus the exact yeah. one? A little bit. Yeah. So that's okay. why we like to use this like more specific version. So let's get into, so can you see this now? Yeah. Okay. So this one is like the most expensive, like, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention at the end of your, the talk about the training and the diet and stuff, which I should have plugged your your programs. I want to do that before we get into the blood work. So what is your effort? Anyone wants to see your, or try your approach to training, to diet. Like we kind of like went over at a surface level here, but to actually like follow a structured plan and get like guidance on exactly what to do, like where should they go? Uh, go to moviestarbody.com. That's my brand new movie star masterclass, a four month program. Um, to get lean. It's got, you know, the, my protocols for, for cutting lean bulking, um, so check that out. That's, that's the single program I'm doing now and, and people are getting great results on that program. Okay. Awesome. Um, yeah. And I would definitely recommend for naturals. Like that's definitely a good go-to start. Like as far as if you're like unsure what to do, um, you've tried the whole dieting crash dieting thing, you know, you've plateaued at low calories and you just don't know what to do. You've ended up skinny fat or you just like, don't even know like how to, you know, how to program correctly. I think, uh, Greg is one of the best naturals in the industry to kind of like get that insight from and try out the program. Sick. So, and, you, and you can also, um, sorry, you can also like, I just set this up. You can also DM me transform and I have a whole little quiz you can go through and find your body type. And I give you some, some good tips on, on the program. So either go to moviestarbody.com or DM me the word transform and, uh, you know, you'll get, you'll get exactly my prescription for your body type. So based on the last blood test, um, the LH, by the way, if we were going to like speculate about if you were natural or not, obviously, you know, we don't have like a full drug test spectrum or anything like that. But at the time in 2016, at the time of that test, like I didn't even see you talking about gonadotropins. You were mostly talking about carbon isotope ratio testing and stuff like that. Like, I don't think people really knew how to interpret blood work to assess negative feedback or gonadotropin output of LH and FSH. So I'm just going to like, Give the benefit of the doubt that at the 2016 test that we just looked at, the LH was the high end of normal. It would be very hard to fake that if you were unnatural. So just putting that out there. Now getting into the 2022 test, part of this was prompted by a video I did on Paul Sklar. He's like this, I don't know, 50 year old guy who has a great physique. A lot of people accuse him of being unnatural. He posted a testosterone result essentially as proof that he's natural. Like, look at my total test. And like, that was it. So a bunch of people tagged me in it. And I basically said like a total test means nothing. This is the test you would need to do to prove that, you know, for a decent amount of time, you are natural. And as long as you're able to maintain your key lifts for a proportional time, like around this test, the likelihood is high that you're natural. Because if you would, if you came off hormones for the test, we would see that indicated likely in the blood work. But even if you took an appropriate amount of time off to kind of like proactively prepare for the test, we would see this dictated in your strength metrics, you know, decreasing suddenly for no apparent reason. So for him, like, I don't even follow his content, to be honest, I just got tagged in the shit. And I just said, like, this is what you need to do. A lot of his followers got really pissed off, which is dumb, because I was just saying, like, a total test means nothing. And this is what you need to get. He ended up going and getting a follow up blood test right after that which i commend him on which i'll probably i still have to do the video follow up on that but greg commented in the comment section like unprompted and said i'd be down to get my blood work assessed too it was like i didn't do a natty or not on greg i didn't do any of the shit he just like randomly was like hey like 
would you do this with me? Let me know. And I said, sure. Like, we'll get a panel done with Merrick Health. Like, are you able to go right away? And he said, yeah. So this is like unprompted. I didn't make a video on him and him went and like, you know, plan this out or some shit. Like he just happened to be like ready to go. So I think that is fairly reinforcing that this was not like a planned thing on your end to go get blood work at some particular time where you cleared shit out of your system. And at least for you, something that I think goes in your favor more so than Paul, not that I'm saying Paul is unnatural or something. I'll get into his stuff separately in a different video, but you actually show like PRs constantly tracked on your Instagram, on your social media. You were like very meticulous about showing your strength metrics, which is ultimately when you look at a blood test, we can't say for certain anything unless we also have corroborating like performance metrics that aren't diminishing because it takes a certain amount of time for your physique to deteriorate after hormone deprivation if you're on exogenous hormones. But like performance numbers too, you'll see those start to dip pretty quick if you were unnatural and then all of a sudden you pulled everything out for a blood test and you've been tracking those like for fucking years at this point, I'd say on your Instagram. Yeah. So like if you prepared for this test in some capacity, we would see this reflected in numbers not looking as good on your Instagram over time. Like something would go off. Like we've seen a lot of guys on YouTube that, you know, showed all of a sudden they gained 50 pounds on their bench and then it would go down and then they have some excuse about their programming is different or this or that. But it was like, it's pretty fucking obvious what was going on a lot of the time. So for you though, I just want to give that disclaimer of like, go look at the performance numbers on Greg's Instagram. Like I have not seen any dips in performance. Like have you, like, I don't, I don't follow it super meticulously, but has your bench, all of your main compounds, like essentially stayed the same for the past, you know, six months yeah, or whatever? Yeah. hundred within 10 pounds. I did, I did cut a little bit. Um, but, but yeah, pretty much, pretty much same thing. You know, my, my standards are usually like, you know, 120 pound incline for 10 reps and yeah. 110 pound dumbbell shoulder presses. And all those lifts are, are, are there on point. So this is the the tough thing for, I don't know if you've seen the Matt does fitness drug test thing that we were going to collect. We were collaborating on as he was going to get drug tested, like full blown, like water approved testing with carbon isotope ratio testing, potentially with the concurrent blood work, like everything was bulletproof, but he was also going to show his lifts while we were randomly testing him. And he just got injured and like blew out his Achilles or something. So right. now he's like in a situation where like it costs like thousands of dollars to do these tests too. So for him, he has to like wait to do the testing now if he wants to do it properly because he can't show that his deadlift and his squat and everything are staying the same. So mm -hmm. for him, it's fucking tough. And I'll probably do a video on that separately too. But for you, it's good because we have like these numbers throughout time and we can kind of give like a baseline judgment. But a lot of this too is going to be looking at your actual like health metrics too because I did notice some aberrations in folate. So in this anemia profile, you know, everything looks reasonable except for your folic acid is low and B12 actually is not, while it looks in normal range, I would actually say this B12 might be a bit on the low side based on what I think you're genetically predisposed to, as we'll get to shortly. So everything in your CBC looks good. I don't think there's any like need to dig into this too elaborately. Um, it looks representative of a natural, like I don't see any like elevations in the red blood cell, hemoglobin, hematocrit, everything looks in line with what I would like. Typically you would see some level of elevation in androgen users, except for guys, if you're on TRT, maybe you wouldn't, or guys who are doing like therapeutic phlebotomies and donating blood or whatever. But ultimately, like I can say this looks natural getting to your cholesterol. So this breakdown with an NMR lipo profile, we see high like uh your hdl is above 50 it's 56 which in general guys on gear or on trt are going to have a tough time keeping a hdl above 50. most of the time guys on gear are well below 40. um and guys on trt have a tough time even keeping it close to 50. so i would say well, come, oh, why is that there's like this uh the process i forget exactly what the enzymatic process is called but it's like hepatic lipase is like increased or something that basically causes a degradation of hdl so like your it's basically impossible for your body to sustain adequate hdl in the serum when you are on exogenous androgens through the interaction with this process so okay. so for you you don't have this androgen like upregulation of this thing going on so you have like a normal normal lipid parameters supported from the lack of exogenous hormone use presumably 
Like it's just in general, it's very rare to see like a good looking HDL on guys who are like, it's even hard to plan for this. If you were trying to like get away with hormone use on paper, there's a lot of things you could do to mask it. But the HDL is like pretty fucking hard to mask as a guy on gear. So I would just say that at a glance is in your favor and your triglycerides look good from a health standpoint. People are going to see the LDLC that it's high and be like, oh shit, is that like, you know, plaque buildup city or like what's going on there? So I did a podcast with somebody named Paul Saladino recently, who's like an animal based diet, I don't know, proponent and used to do carnivore diet. And in general, if you want to hear like a more scientific breakdown of the lipid parameters, I would definitely recommend hearing his description on the, the on the progression of atherosclerosis and plaque buildup. But from just a summarization, if we see this LDLC high, I don't see that as problematic inherently, unless you also are like metabolically unhealthy. So for you, we would look at things like fasting insulin. We would look at things like potentially inflammatory markers, like C-reactive protein. And we can kind of infer like how well your body is able to tolerate your current diet model, how much plaque you may be accumulating. Now, some of this is like very heavily debated in the nutrition community about like the importance of LDLC on paper and like if it should be, you know, below like 100 or even below 70 apparently is the number where it's impossible to build plaque up but in general like you're in a deficit a lot of the time or you're at, you have a very healthy like proportion of macros you are like very very lean you're metabolically healthy at a like perceptive like first glance as well as when i look at your fasting insulin levels if we scroll all the way down that is like the main marker of how much your pancreas is like working to sustain your blood sugar levels. So like if you're fasting, which you were at the time of this test, right? Yeah. Yeah. So he was fasting. So we would see in general, like a higher insulin level for guys who are like less metabolically healthy because they're, they're pushing out more insulin to keep their glucose at a normal level because their body is like less metabolically apt to handle whatever they're doing in their current lifestyle. So insulin resistance is higher rather than being insulin sensitive, et cetera. So for you, when we go down to the, uh, hopefully I didn't scroll past it, fasting insulin, 1.3 low. So it's like the, like, it's not, I would definitely get this checked again on the next yeah. follow-up we do, but this is like, if anything, representative of like extreme metabolic health and insulin sensitivity. Like this is like the pinnacle of like metabolic, like perfection from what I would speculate in a fasting level. So for you, it would be interesting to see like how quickly you're able to like pull your glucose levels back down after you eat like a carb dense meal. But from what, at a glance, the fact that you had this like fasted in the morning or late afternoon, which is notable as well, when we get to the testosterone levels, the time of the test, what was the time of the test again? Well, uh, just before 2 PM. Yeah. Okay. So it was 1, like 1 50 PM. Yeah. Okay. So that the fact that your 1.3 insulin is like very, very, I don't know, reinforcing. It's kind of irrelevant to the anabolic discussion, but it's more so just like your health parameters. Like this is very good. And this is like something shooting as close to like this 2.6 number is like what people should strive for when it comes to metabolic health mm -hmm. at a fasting insulin level. So your pancreas does not have to work very hard because your glucose levels are sustained at 78 without even like really having to try. So you have like no stress or your beta cells in your pancreas. Your diet is like pretty fucking dialed in. You're lean, insulin sensitive as fuck. looks really good. So this LDLC, I'm not like, I'm not like too worried about that. In the presence of metabolic, like poor metabolic health, I would be more concerned about this being atherosclerotic in like nature. But I would keep an eye on it just for the sake of caution but with the other markers being like quite in line with like a very fit individual i'm not overly concerned about this number so i just want to put it out there cool. also to be noted i'm not a fucking lipidologist or cardiologist so take what i'm saying with a grain of salt and run these things by your own doctor when you're interpreting your lipids don't just defer to a youtuber when it comes to your interpretation of blood test panels and this is why we have experts and doctors at Merrick Health who will actually interpret this stuff for you. This is just for the sake partially of entertainment and because presumably 
you know, like seeing me talk about it with Greg is like a, a bit of a more unique scenario, but this is the stuff your doctor would interpret through America health, not me, obviously. So anyways, getting to the rest of the stuff, um, this was the lipids all looked good. Nothing to me was concerning and was representative of a natural athlete. Um, thyroid looked good. It doesn't look like your body's like too stressed trying to produce thyroid hormone. Like your TSH is a representation of the stimulating hormone that is signaling how much T4 to then produce, which downstream leads to T3 conversion. This looks good. I wouldn't really, you know, try and elaborate too much more on that. This is like a proxy for metabolism in some scenario, um, in some context, but for you, it looks good enough that I don't think it's worth elaborating on much further than that. But if you have like a higher than a three TSH consistently, I would probably like at least bring it up with your provider and just like see, I don't know, maybe dig a bit further and see why your thyroid's like working so hard to like produce the amount of hormone necessary. But for you, I wouldn't really, you know, dig into this too more, too much more. Um, comprehensive metabolic panel. We're looking at your kidney parameters as well as your liver function and everything looks good. Kidney function here is estimated glomerular filtration rate based on this creatinine, which is, um, a more rough metric to assess kidney function and down on the test later, we have a more insightful and sensitive parameter to test it, which we'll get to shortly when we get there. But the only thing that was concerning, and these AST and ALT are like perfect, which is liver function. And in general, anabolic users are typically going to have higher, higher liver enzymes. So this, you know, it's not uncommon to see guys hovering like, I don't know, 40, 50, 60 who are on anabolics. And that's like sometimes way fucking higher for on oral anabolic steroids too. Even SARMs, you see this number like very, very close to the triple digits, if not like well into the triple digits in guys who are using oral compounds. So this looks good to me from a health standpoint too. Alkaline phosphatase being low. Um, so for this number, like personally for me, um, this is like, it's not something I'm overly familiar with, but as far as I recall, it was like an enzyme found in a bunch of different areas of the body, like liver, kidneys, digestive system, and um, leakage into the bloodstream can be representative of like liver damage to some extent. So this is why it's still featured in the like metabolic panel section. Um, so for me, when I see low, I might get a follow-up just to assess like if it's a transient like aberration that was low, but low is better than high, obviously. High would indicate liver stress likely, but for this, I would just do a follow-up to then see if it's consistently low. And then from there kind of like dial in if there's actually a problem and what that is. But it may be tied into the um, methylation impairments that we'll get into shortly, which is what I speculate to be a genetic predisposition. This urine analysis, specific gravity, it might be, did you drink like a fuck ton of water beforehand or something? Um, I don't recall drinking a fuck ton of water, but like I definitely was drinking <laughs> yeah. quite a bit of water. Okay. Like, so this might just yeah. be like overly diluted urine from having like drank a lot of water beforehand. Like everything else looks good. So that's the only reason why it's on the low end of normal. So I'm not really concerned about it. I just assume that this is like a very diluted sample, but yeah, that's kind of just my stance on that. I'm not too concerned about it. Getting into the gonadotropin. So these are kind of representative of pituitary output of hormones that lead to intratesticular testosterone production and sperm production and maturation. So luteinizing hormone um, is the main thing that acts on the Leydig cells to then produce testosterone. So guys who are on TRT even, this is something that's going to be shut down it's not like a dose dependent manner necessarily, because even at like a replacement level of test, you're going to be sub therapeutic, like this 1.7 low end of the reference range, 1.5 low end of the reference range. If you look at a guy on gear, his LH and FSH are like undetectable often or like 0 0.02 or 0 0.03 or something like that. So for you, having an FSH and LH in range means that you have normal HPTA axis function where once your body has a certain amount of testosterone that it needs to produce, it signals to your hypothalamus to then spit out something called gonadotropin releasing hormone, it goes to your pituitary gland. And then it tells your pituitary, you need to produce a certain amount of LH and FSH, which goes down to your testes to then spit out a certain amount of test. So the fact that this is in range is like, 
representative of somebody who has natural function right now. So it would be very hard to fake this if at the time of the test, you were on anything, like even t TRT, even if you came off of TRT, the likelihood is pretty fucking low that you would be able to clear the hormone in such a short time frame, go do the test and have a restoration of this because anybody who's on TRT or exogenous hormones, you would have a clearance time of even with a short ester, at least like I'm assuming it would be fucking unfathomable to think you were on like no ester testosterone that's like in and out of your system in a day, just randomly at the time of me making this Instagram post, which wasn't even targeting you whatsoever. So like, even if you were on TRT, you would be on like a longer ester, like an enanthate or recipientate that would take weeks to clear out of your system before you would see these numbers come back into the normal range. So me just looking at this at a glance, I see LH and FSH in range and I'm thinking the fact that this was unprompted and you just went and got it done on a whim and I didn't like make a fucking natty or not on you. And then you were like, Oh, like, let me like plan for this or something. Mm -hmm. Like it just, it just looks natural, like plain as day. So that is definitely in your favor. Um, and definitely worth mentioning because a lot of people might think, you know, Oh, you just, if you, if you had the ability to plan for these tests, like perhaps there is a way you could get around it. Yeah. Like I've talked about this many times, circumventing drug testing, how you would plan even for random tests to occur. The thing is though, is when they do random tests in via WADA, it's kind of baffling, but they don't even test for this. So they'll test your urine for like all of the steroids. They'll test your blood for like, you know, they'll actually test for EPO from a red flag in your, you know, hematology way up here. They'll check your red blood cell count, hemoglobin, hematocrit, and see if there's like weird fluctuations and then see if they should test you for EPO. But they will not do something as basic as use that same blood to test for LH and FSH, which to me, is fucking baffling because it's like if you was if I was on a designer steroid or something, my LH and FSH would be in the gutter. But like you're not going to just like randomly be able to figure out that a guy's on a designer steroid that's undetectable. But at least if we had some clue as to their hormones are suppressed, it would be like, huh, this guy has shut down for like no reason. So he must be using something. Like, why else would your hormones be shut down unless you were doing the most aggressive weight cut in fucking history, essentially? So for me, I see an LH and FSH in range and I think natural, it's just, it's just baffling to me. And I feel like it should be made clear that even at the highest Olympic level testing, they don't test LH and FSH, which is fucking dumb and makes no sense. But anyway, is there a way someone could go on TRT and take drugs to stimulate LH and FSH? Yeah. So that would be, um, Something that they also test for in the urine analysis is those drugs that would be like fertility enhancing right. for you though. The only way you would be able to do that is if you administer like recombinant LH and recombinant LH, recombinant LH and recombinant FSH or use something called HMG. So most people, first of all, in Canada, the access, the level of connection and access you would need to get pharmaceutical grade HMG or LH and FSH on their own is like wild how connected you would have to be randomly. In addition to that, if you pin them trying to get around this in order to plan for like a Derrick analysis of your blood work, because again, if you were doing Olympic testing, you don't got to worry about this at all. But if you're being like an analyzed by me, you would have to hope that your random shot of bioidentical LH didn't push your levels into like higher territory too. Because if right. I saw this number was like 10, because you pinned some like random amount of LH into your belly fat and was like, oh, I'm going to get around the test by being on TRT and taking literal fucking LH, the likelihood that you're going to like accurately address, accurately target the amount of LH that makes you look natural and not overshoot it by some amount and time the test accurately too is like baffling psychotic levels of planning that I would not imagine anyone would do unprompted. Like the fact, the likelihood that you traveled to Miami over the border and brought illegally HMG or recombinant LH and FSH with you would be like mind bogglingly fucked up because it's not like you were planning for this either. So you would have had to smuggle some shit, somehow know I was going to make this post on blood work and then be ready to go like a day beforehand and pin some like indiscriminate amount of LH and FSH and hope that it was going to land in this reference range. And it's not like you have control over you get to see the blood work before I do. Like my lab literally fucking sends me the blood work too. So mm -hmm. anyway, that's like, 
the the planning for this would be impossible to a level of not even Olympic athletes are doing this. So I'll just put it that way. I did. Uh, I, someone, yeah, I heard that skepticism. Oh, if you see the, the gun and tropins, you see LHFSA 12, you know, you could take fertility hormones to do some that. Some people but. think if you took HCG, they're like, oh, just take a certain amount of HCG, which is something that's pretty readily accessible. That is that is a mimic of LH. It comes from like pregnant women's urine, essentially. And that is, again, not actual LH. So you would actually see your LH and FSH go to zero on exogenous HCG. So the thing that most people think you would cheat with, which is HCG, and you can get prescribed pretty easily from a TRT clinic, is something that stimulates lytic cells to produce testosterone. You'd use it while you're on TRT, potentially, if you want to maintain fertility or like maintain good fertility is a more accurate way to represent that statement, but it doesn't do anything to increase your LH and FSH like people think it does. So the likelihood that you could plan for this with drugs that are extremely difficult to procure and get prescriptions for, and essentially impossible to get in Canada, you would have had, and the amount of planning that goes into smuggling this over the border, fucking having it on hand, knowing exactly how much to pin to get your shit into range, knowing I was going to make a blood test post on some other guy, mind boggling psychotic levels of planning. So I am pretty confident this is natural. So can you give me two seconds, by the way? Yeah, sure. Two seconds. Okay. Okay, recording is back. Let me get this blood work back up. Share screen, preview. Okay, can you see it again? Yeah. Yeah. Is it still on the screen when I go like this? I'm just checking. Yeah, it's still, still right. on the screen. Okay, so we just went over the gonadotropins, and let me just double check. We are indeed recording. Uh, it says recording on my thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, just wanted to make sure. I'm like fucking hyper paranoid about that yeah, stuff. Yeah, hundred percent. Okay, so we are um, at the. Actually, I'm just going to double check myself. One sec. Okay, pause recording. Okay, yeah, it's definitely in there. Preview. Okay, so the gonadotropins we just went over, all that stuff. I think we've rolled that. That part is essentially beat to death. So testosterone total in free. So this is the interesting thing is people see a disproportionately high free testosterone. They're probably going to assume like typically we see that represented in individuals who are on TRT, to be honest. Like we see a disproportionately high free relative to the total T and it's because SHBG is lower, but that is in general based on an SHBG like estimated free T. So remember earlier, I was talking about how the reference ranges are different and the units of measurement are different. The gold standard is equilibrium dialysis. So basically, this thing we use to assess your free T is literally a far more sensitive and direct measurement, whereby we have actual nanograms per deciliter. And you see the reference interval. The reference range is only 5 to 21. So for me, I think this is far too low because when they use a free testosterone estimation, through free, it's called free testosterone direct, and they use something called an amino assay to assess it, it's far, it's not as accurate, but the reference range is far more forgiving as far as how high it goes. So like, you know, in some countries they'll have a total T that only goes up to like 700 or something. Obviously if a guy's at 800 total T naturally, it doesn't necessarily mean that he's on gear. Like you have to look at the whole picture to really understand what's going on. So I see this 21 is the high end of the reference range. And that is based on this reference range, frankly, just not going high enough. Like we see guys who have a thousand totals, you know, maybe they'll be at like 30 and they could be natural still. This is not a range that I think it needs to be like five to like 30 personally. And in our clinic at Merrick Health, we will typically base hormone optimization parameters around like a high end of around 30. So getting to your SHBG in this total, like this total 515, we speculated it was lower a little bit than your previous results, which were more around like the 600, low 600 range because of time of testing. So it was in the afternoon as well as shit sleep that you had multiple days because of like construction and stuff like that. And also I think you had like some other factors you were like drinking a couple of days prior or something. Uh, like? Yeah, I, I was in Miami a lot. So I was, I was drinking a lot. I didn't drink the day before. Um, 
Uh, but you know, the week leading up minus day before I drank moderately, I'd say three times that week, five, Eight. six drinks. And air conditioning was not working. So it was too hot in the room too, as well. Yeah. So my, yeah, my sleep, the big thing definitely was like my sleep was especially the night before my sleep was really, really bad. Okay. Um, but, uh, other than but, that, you didn't lift for 72 hours prior, which is good. As far as people watching, this is something to note. If you're going to look at your kidney and liver parameters, they can be artificially skewed if you lift like heavy as fuck a day prior to your test. So I just want to make that clear. But the sleep, I would imagine, had the most the most impactful on this result because it's not that much different, honestly. Like it could have just been like the time of day too. Like you had it done at one, like 45 or whatever it was. Like, it's not that, it's not like it's at fucking 300 or something. So 515, based on diurnal rhythms, your testosterone can fluctuate up and down like 200, 300 nanograms per deciliter even. I'm not thinking this is like, it, like from a health perspective even, like I think you could chalk this up to time of day and bad sleep. Mm -hmm. And you're probably on the next test, you might be back at 600. So, and we can do that follow-up. As far as free testosterone, so this is 21.97 which is good for your total T, but it is not representative what I would say is like actual super physiological territory. So in general, if somebody saw like a thousand or 1100 total T, like that in general for most reference ranges is like super physiological based on the equilibrium dialysis test that we do, which is the most accurate for finding out what your, your free T actually is, the reference range is too low in my opinion. I'm not just saying that to fucking like cover your ass or something. Cause when we look at your SHBG number, it is 31.1. So that's like dead in the middle, essentially almost of SHBG. So in general, the way it works is your body produces a certain amount of testosterone and it floats around in circulation and the way it gets like actually transported to target tissues and also modulated of how much is like freely available to use to make sure you're not like hyper androgen dominant all the time is we have this binding protein, which is SHBG, as well as something called albumin and other binding proteins, which are less relevant because SHBG is the main one that binds up the most testosterone in the body, as well as DHT and to a lesser extent estrogen. But this number at 31.1, in general, guys who are on gear, we see this single digits or below 16.5 almost every single fucking time. Like it's the, other than HDL, this number, maintenance of it, is quite difficult on exogenous androgens for the most part. So for me, I see this, this is a reinforcing number of natural status and the number of the free test number, when you look at it relative to the SHBG on paper, it looks a lot more normal than you would otherwise be assumed based on like an aberrant high result. Like we see 4.26%, 21.97 high above the reference range, you automatically think, potentially on something, but the gonadotropins don't reinforce this. The SHBG doesn't reinforce this. My speculation is that you might have a high DHT production, a high DHT level, which I didn't test in this test, which we can add to your panel separately on the next one. But basically SHBG, it's this binding protein that like binds up testosterone, DHT and estrogen. And then it's kind of like proportional hierarchy of binding affinity, which is like the likelihood or propensity of it to bind up a hormone, DHT is like magnitudes higher than testosterone. So if you have high DHT, the SHBG is mostly going to be occupied, occupying this DHT versus your testosterone less or so and estrogen even less or so. So it could, if you have a high DHT level, be more free testosterone in circulation, not as a result of low SHBG, which is what we see with androgen users, rather, it is your DHT being high that's just occupying all the SHBG. So your testosterone that would otherwise be bound by it, there's more freely in circulation because you have so much, so much DHT potentially, which we would where's have to find. DH, where's the DHT produced? Um, like the enzyme that produces it, you mean? Or okay. Where okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, you have your uh, DHAE, uh, the, the one that's related to, you know. Yeah, so production. yeah. There's an enzyme called 5-alpha reductase which okay. is like the thing that finasteride inhibits for hair loss prevention, that enzyme produces DHT. Basically your testosterone can either remain as testosterone or it can aromatize into estrogen or it can 5-alpha reduce into DHT. 
And if you have more 5 alpha reduction to DHT through use of like creatine might upregulate this certain things. Do you use creatine on a daily basis? Um, I go on and off. I haven't used creatine in a few months. So yeah. Um, yeah. That's something you should use for health purposes, by the way, for your like yeah. methylation stuff. But we'll get to that okay. shortly. So as a follow-up, I would want to check your DHT just to see like why this free test is high. But -hmm. again, this high is like, it's not that high. If I saw like a 28 or a 29, I'd be like, that is weird for your total T being 515. But we're we're using this assay that's like highly sensitive. It's not the same as seeing a 21 on a free direct immunoassay. And I know I'm speaking gibberish for a lot of people right now. They're like, what the fuck are you talking about? But at the end of the day, this free test is a far more expensive and sensitive assay that I think, and it is in the literature, the gold standard. It's just most people don't get it because it's cost prohibitive. So for us, I wanted to do like everything as high quality as possible for Greg's test and kind of like show the elaborate stuff we go through at Merrick Health to make sure everything's like fully fucking dialed in. And this 21 is not representative of like a high free T in my opinion, or else we would see this SHBG being much lower. Like if he actually had a disproportionately high free based on low binding proteins, this SHBG would be like 10 or something. So for me, I think this is something we can retest on the next one, but this is like, this looks good. Like, I think this is like a good reading. That means you have healthy amount of free testosterone that may be a tad high, but I speculate it's from your DHT level. That's yeah. just, yeah. So oh, two, you know, yeah. two, just two questions for you. Um, so, you know, 515 for me is low. I've done my testosterone test, um, you know, five times, I think. And it's always been like 620, 650, 610. Um, do you think if I, if my testosterone, my sleep was good, X, Y, and Z, and my testosterone came back at 615, do you think it would, my free testosterone would be 20% higher or, or, or not? Potentially. Yeah. But that would be, um, like ultimately your free test is dictated by how much total there is. So yeah, it could right. be, could be higher too. But again, the kind of level we see at like the maxed out individual who is like manually administering replacement therapy, we see this closer to like 30 in general. So like for me, like we aim at aim kind of general terms for guys on TRT. Cause again, it's kind of like wherever you get symptom relief is where your TRT dose is best. Ideally like minimum effective dose, but the optimized zone for free T is between 20 and 30. So like when I see 21.97, this is like in the optimal zone, but it's not like steroid level territory is kind of like the overarching conclusion of that. So and do you think someone's better off if they have like, total testosterone 622 free T um, versus total testosterone 817 free T. Like, do you think it, is it, is it, does at the end of the day, is it like literally just how much free testosterone that's going to make a difference for building muscle and physique or does total testosterone matter too? Um, they both matter, but it's more so your androgen receptor content in the muscle Muscles. and your actual like gene transcription that affects how much you can like make use of those hormones. So like I see some of the best naturals, like for example, there's this guy on our gorilla mind athlete team. His name's Lex Little. His testosterone is like 500 or something, but he has like the nuttiest physique of a 20 year old you'll ever fucking see. And he's totally natural. And this is like proved through he was WADA drug tested with a concurrent blood test at the same time. And he got like PR level lifts at the same time. Yeah. And he had like a normal looking total test and like a very normal looking free test. So ultimately it's, there are some guys who have like shitty physiques on like 800 total tests. It doesn't mean they're going to be jacked. It's ultimately like your genetic response to those hormones. So like, yeah, you could probably build more muscle with like a higher total and the free yeah, if you had more bound up, you could maybe have less muscle building potential than if you had a higher free, but that would be at the detriment potentially of other health markers too. Like you would have more sympathetic drive, like you would be more like redlined on a daily day, day to day basis. It might be harder to sleep. It might be more agitated. Like there's definitely a happy medium in your body when it's natural, it's pretty fucking good about balancing it out. So like for you, like, I don't necessarily see this as like bad or I don't know, like to me, it seems 
a little bit high to a point that I would retest it for sure and just like see why it's high. Like maybe it's the DHT being high and that's why. But I don't necessarily see if you were to compare a guy with an 800 total and like a 17 free versus a guy with a 600 total and a 22 free, if they had the exact same genetics and everything was fucking exactly the same, I don't necessarily know that I'd see like a massive or like a quantifiable difference in terms of outcome. Like maybe you could argue the guy with the free tee is a little bit better off from like a, uh, I don't know, like a drive perspective in the gym. Maybe he gets a bit more muscle out of it, but there is something to be said about the total testosterone level too. And how much is available to actually use. It's like, you could argue the guy with 800. The only reason he has a lower free T is because his body is like trying to bind up more of the total. It's kind of like, it's kind of up for speculation. I don't think it's that important. I just think that as long as your binding proteins are good, you don't have too low of a proportion and not too high. Like guys on keto diets, will typically see this 31 would be like fucking 70, 80, 90, like that high to a point where if you're dieting and you have an SHBG of 90, you have like no free testosterone essentially. And you're like waking up with no morning wood. You have no sex drive. You have the like equivalent kind of function of a guy who has like no test, even though your total T on paper is like 500. So yeah, the I, I literally experienced that when I did yeah. low carb. Yeah. Yeah. So ultimately the overarching thing is between 20 and 30 is what I see like the optimized male at. And I think 21.97 is like pretty, pretty dialed in. It's just slightly proportionally higher than your total. But I think follow-up testing would be useful to see if your DHT is like ridiculously high for some reason. But ultimately, as long as your LH and FSH are in range, your SHBG isn't crushed into the ground by exogenous hormones, HDL looks good. Um, like I can pretty fucking confidently say like this is still natural based on all of the other factors for sure. This is just a metric most people are quite unfamiliar with because no one does high sensitivity testing. This is something that's unique to our platform that I push for because I want the most like, stringent parameters. Like some people who have normal looking free tea that use the cheap amino assay test might have a similar level to you if they did the high sensitivity test. So I just want to make that clear because I know there's going to be a lot of kind of like ambiguity around like why this is this reference range is so low. Like what's the difference between the free T that nor normally is on paper that goes up to 28 or 29. So mm -hmm. ultimately we do still want to see this at 20 to 30 for an optimized male, in my opinion. For, for naturals. Yeah. Okay. Well, even guys on replacement therapy, because that's like guys on replacement therapy are guys who presumably need to be on hormone assistance to have good hormone levels in their blood. So if you were trying to replicate what a good natural is, you would want to see that free test at like 20 to 30. So mm -hmm. the likelihood is low that you're ever going to have a natural with close to 30 free T. That's like very fucking unlikely, but that's like the line in the sand where like optimized versus like hormonally assisted really is, is kind of blurred nowadays too. So it's kind of hard to say, you know, mm -hmm. like, could you even get to replicate natural levels on TRT without fucking with the HDL without fucking with the SHBG without fucking with the hematology. It's kind of difficult to like dial it in exactly, but like an optimized male for like maxed out production or maxed out hormonal function without being too androgen dominant is typically like 20 to 30. So anyway, moving into the, this is a cystatin C it's the most accurate way in blood to assess your kidney function. So this is a far more accurate assessment of your glomerular, it's hard to fucking say, estimated glomerular filtration rate than the creatinine calculated one that we had at the top here. So this is, where is it? This creatinine is used to calculate this number in the metabolic panel, but the cystatin C is a far more accurate way to assess it. And it's in line. It's like the gold standard of blood work. So we always add this separately for like high sensitivity kidney check, essentially for individuals. And I actually have a low cystatin C too. This is not concerning in my opinion at all. I would definitely do a follow up on the next one just to see what it's at again. But ultimately low closer to the 0.6 is representative of better um, filtration in your kidneys. Like that's why your GFR is so high here, 138. The lower this number is, in general, the worse your kidney function is. So this number as you age, just by deterioration of your organs, 
goes down and down and down to a point that if anyone lived long enough, they would probably have kidney failure. If you didn't die from cancer, you would eventually have heart failure, kidney failure, probably one of those two things. So, and that's kind of like the shitty fucking paradox of being a human is <laughs> like organs can only live for so long. Even if you manage to live a long time, eventually you get cancer or kidneys fuck up or heart fucks up, unfortunately. Um, but anyway, this is, this is good to me. And this is representative of like high tier kidney function. I would get a follow up on this, but it's like almost representative of like too good of kidneys as dumb as that sounds. Mm -hmm. So anyways, we'll get a follow up on that next time, but this has nothing to do with androgen use. If anything, we would see this being higher and this number lower if you're abusing androgens for sure. Hemoglobin A1C, this is a representation of just like your average like blood glucose levels over time and your insulin sensitivity metrics this is like a very rough way to assess pre-diabetes diabetes glycemic control it's fucking great i wouldn't read too much into this we already know your fasting insulin is like rock bottom so that in itself is the like red gold standard for assessing insulin sensitivity metrics so this is great wouldn't read into this too much more alpha fetoprotein this is like a liver cancer metric looks fine um, DHA sulfate, this means your adrenal function seemingly is like high normal, like good. Cortisol is a bit on the high side, but I think it's more so because, um, like, I actually, no, it's right in line based on the time of the test. So I would say this is good. Um, I wouldn't be too concerned about that. Like, maybe you could argue that it's a bit high based on this being a PM test, but having your sleep fucked up is going to be one of the main things that contributes to like hypercortisol, whatever the scientific term is, hypercortisolemic or whatever the fuck, like having higher cortisol is going to be impacted highly from poor sleep. So I would just get this retested. But to me, I'm not too concerned about it based on the context going into the test. Um, this can be problematic for individuals who are natural with low T, by the way. A lot of them, they think that they need TRT when in reality, their sleep is just fucked up and they have like their adrenals are like overworked and they're in a state of like hypercortisol dominance, which can have like negative feedback essentially, whereby you produce less testosterone. So a lot of people have low T, they need to look at this number as well as assess their sleep metrics and see like what's going on. Um, Cause sometimes fixing sleep could like correct a low test level. And some people, they think they need TRT when they don't. Um, let's see, prostate specific antigen, this looks good. IGF-1 is pretty fucking good considering that you're like, how many calories have you been eating lately? Um, around that test, I was re eating like maintenance 2,600. Okay. Okay. Well, that's like pretty in line. Then if you're on, if you have a decent amount of carbs in your diet mm -hmm. and like, again, the only thing somebody might be able to speculate is if you're using GH, which again is not going to keep your lifts up. So even if you're on like a replacement amount of GH, you might have like be able to get away with one or two units and get your IGF to like 240 if you had low normal levels naturally. But that would be super speculative and ultimately would not be something that helps hold your strength at all. So like I don't see this as a representation. Like it's literally natural levels. It's just high normal. So to me, this is like a good response of your body's ability to generate growth factors in the liver and looks natural so i wouldn't read too much into it reverse t3 that one help but that's going to help with with putting on muscle be on the higher end of that um potentially yeah like there is some argument in the enhanced community whether having higher igf1 actually helps or not but we do see in cancer development higher igf1 definitely accelerates cancer cell proliferation so based on some of the extrapolations we can do, like people use IGF-1 to basically cause proliferation of satellite cells, which can then donate nuclei to then be able to essentially create more myonuclei you can induce hypertrophy in. So if you have more myonuclei in the muscle, you can then induce hypertrophy in more cells that leads to a greater, like bigger muscle fucking fiber, essentially. So yeah, a higher IGF-1, you could definitely you could use that as a proxy for greater ability to build muscle, but that's based on the assumption that your body's like receptors are actually able to make use of it. Cause again, you could have a thousand total testosterone, but that guy has a way worse physique than you who has 515. You know what I mean? 
So it's like their androgen receptors and gene expression is going to dictate if they can even make use of that amount of hormone. So sometimes you see higher numbers are actually correlated with lower sensitivity to those hormones. So your body, the response it makes is I need to make more to then achieve adequate receptor activation that another guy maybe gets at a lower number. You know what I mean? So the number doesn't always represent better. It's just in the context of you, like, yeah, a higher IGF-1 for you would be more muscle than a 240. Or for you, a 700 total T would be probably a little bit better than a 515. But for the next guy, we're comparing anyone to any other people. It doesn't, it doesn't like match up like that. And you can't test. Well, I mean, there's no reasonable way to test engine receptor density. Um, like not in an easy way for, yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, but like, ultimately like we just see the representation and results of individuals though. And I think that's like, you could take fucking gear and see how much you blow up. That would be a way to test, you know, <laughs> but not everyone's going to do that. Obviously. Um, let's see. Vitamin D looks good to me. Lapro protein, little a, this is, um, one of the most progressive metrics for cardiovascular disease progression for atherosclerosis. And this number being undetectable is really in your favor for plaque buildup. So this is great to see, um, C reactive protein. This is a measure of inflammation in your body. And we like to see less than a 0.3 in general. So the fact you're at 0.23 is good. It means that your lifestyle and or genetics in unison with your lifestyle are at least conducive enough to have a like low inflammatory systemically. So low inflammation systemically is obviously good for avoiding disease progression and how much that ties into certain like atherosclerosis and whatnot. It's kind of up for debate, but ultimately we want inflammation acutely at certain times, like around our workouts, we induce inflammation. That's like kind of what dictates the muscle growth response and signaling to your body that you need to, you know, recover and like build more tissue to accommodate that increased like stress on the muscle. Um, and that's why certain things like non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs kind of are inhibitory towards muscle growth. Um, but having this C-reactive protein on the bottom end on like a non-training day, you just went in randomly. Like this looks good, especially considering your sleep was shitty. So this is like representative of like good health. TMAO being high. So this is something that is typically elevated from like carnitine ingestion, red meat, supplementation with things like choline, carnitine. And you are, again, like the medical decision limits on this. This is a test not really many people get. So it's not actually that bad, at least at my general like cursory glance, because again, low, less than 6.2, you're like right in moderate range. So I guess as far as I know, does your pre-workout or anything have like carnitine in it? Um, no, not the pre-workout. Um, I, I do eat a lot of red meat. Okay. So that might be the reason, but the thing that makes me speculative about it is as we get later, your homocysteine fucking sky high, bro. This is like the most concerning metric on the whole test. Yeah. This has nothing to do with anabolic use. This is totally health related and genetics in my opinion. So we have a 71.3, um, presumably micromole per liter with a high end of 14.5. Typically we want to see this under like nine would be like good. So the fact you're at 71.3 to me implies like either severe vitamin deficiency or like methylation impairment, which is corroborated throughout your blood work. Cause if you circle back at the start, we saw the folate deficiency here. And you start to think like for guys who have, it's called MTHFR polymorphism. So it's not like a mutation in your gene where it's so, so like rare that almost no one has it. And it's defined as a mutation. It's a polymorphism. So it's like the one I speculate you have is the same one I have, which is like less than 4% of the population I think has it. And it's like such an impairment in, um, um, like you have low folate, folate levels, B12 is typically on the low end, homocysteine is high and your methylation is impaired. Methylation is like your body's ability to turn on and off genes and to, um, as well as your ability to process a lot of these nutrients. So like a breakdown of the actual, let me see if I can screen share it. Uh, you, you know what my, I have three brothers, my one brother that's very genetically similar to me, he did a genetic testing and he had the. He had the uh, 
the morphism of the MTFHR gene. Okay. Yeah. So like there's a few, there's, there's different ones. They're not all the same, but the one that is the most problematic, it's called C67T. Let me see if I can bring up the actual SNP that you need to check. So it's basically, if you got like 23andMe done, for example, you would check, um, it's called RS1801133 is the SNP. Basically, it's the single nucleotide. Um, like the, there, It's kind of, I feel like I'm going to be rambling into like scientific terminology that people don't even understand. But um, the gene that you want to check for is MTHFR. And you want to check for, you just type in on the search bar of the 23andMe, like, I don't know, like gene, like they have a, a little search bar you can like nail down actually searching for a specific gene that encodes for something, you would check this marker, RS1801133, and that is the C677T um, polymorphism, if you have it. So there you would see a genotype. I should fucking just screen share this. I'm just trying to figure out how I can bring it up here. Um, Was your homocysteine elevated when you weren't on folate? Yeah, so I take creatine, betaine, methylfolate, um, choline, um, and I ensure adequate B12 intake as well. Um, those are all things that help bring it down. So like basically the explanation of how this whole thing works is, um, like the C677T1 results in like 10 to 20% of the efficiency in processing folic acid, which the result of that is high homocysteine, low B12 and folate levels. Cause your body's so inefficient at it essentially. So Supplementing with methyl folate specifically, not folic acid, would be recommended if you're not getting enough from your diet. So that would be like 400 micrograms is kind of like the gold standard of supplementation for that. Um, in addition, providing your body with adequate methyl groups, because basically you have the cycling process where your body um, recycles homocysteine to methionine as well as converts choline to betaine. So like a lot of these things people might actually see in supplements like betaine is an osmolite that helps performance in the gym choline is the precursor to acetylcholine which is like you know neurotransmitter function that is otherwise crucial for you know mental clarity flexibility information retention memory formation and these things can get depleted when you are essentially impeding your body's ability to cycle through these things properly because you have inadequate methyl donors or folate to actually do the process properly. So well, when nutrient needs aren't met fully, the body depends on this conversion or recycling of homocysteine to methionine equally to converting choline to betaine. You can end up depleting one or the other if you are MTHFR homozygous for C670, which means basically your 23andMe would show on that SNP marker that I talked about, it would show a genotype of A-A this is really, I know, like hard to fucking wrap your head around if I can't visually show you. But at the same time, I have like uh, my screen share. I'm trying to not like have like random shit on my computer pop up. I'm just <laughs> trying to keep it on my fucking. And, my, and uh, only only four percent have that morphism that like is ten or twenty percent absorption or or. Yeah, I believe so. It might be more prevalent than that, but apparently in Europeans, especially like I'm half Italian for me, it's like very, very common among Italians. And I don't know about what other populations or like areas of Europe that it's common, but mm. it's like in general, I believe found most prominently in European ancestry. Um, but basically, if you can't create enough methylfolate, your body like ramps up the use of other things like betaine and choline to give those methyl groups, which then allow your body to methylate, turn genes on and off, which is like your response to, you've talked about epigenetics before, like turning yeah. genes on and off. That sort of process is dictated by this pathway. So for you and I, we have like a very impaired ability to do that adequately. And as we age, that process will get like really fucking shitty if we don't supplement properly or eat the proper foods appropriate to our deficiencies. So, um, and there's, there's a five it's, it's, it's uh methylfolate B12, uh, betaine, betaine, uh, creatine choline. Yeah. I'm going through one of my old articles right now, actually to double check. I'm not missing any, but, um, 
in general, like some of the things that might happen downstream is choline depletion leads to impaired cognitive function. So getting enough choline through like eggs are good, or you can supplement with like, I use alpha GPC often through my um, nootropic formula as well. Betaine is a very, very good for performance as well as for supporting this methylation process. Creatine, I think everyone who is natural or not, it's like the most tried and true ergogenic aid from a supplementation perspective, having like five grams of creatine. Some people who weigh more might be able to benefit from more than that, but in general, like three to five grams of creatine is like a gold standard and supports. There's like so much new data coming out supporting that it helps with neurological health, fertility, a bunch of different shit that is um, worthwhile to supplement with it above and beyond the performance in the gym. Um, as well, like your methylfolate intake, ensuring you're hitting your needs that could be through supplementation. If you're not, if your diet is like dialed in right now, like this is the whole need for supplementation is if you have a diet, that's like, you don't want to change it. And then you supplement on top of it. Like this is where the use of like a single methylfolate supplement might be useful, where the use of a betaine anhydrous might be useful. Like for you, it's represented pretty fucking clearly. Your folate's low B12, I would say is like low normal. And then your homocysteine is like sky fucking high. So I would speculate if you added in five grams of creatine, maybe a few grams of betaine, um, 400 micrograms of methylfolate. Um, if you wanted to, like you could add, swap some things for eggs in your diet if you felt that it was, you know, satiating enough still to stick to your diet model. But if you don't want to do that, you could just add in like a, an alpha GPC or CDP choline for your choline donor. Um and those things should um, help a lot and help bring your homocysteine way down. So those are things I would definitely uh, look at implementing, to be honest. And homocysteine, that's, that's like not one you want elevated. No, no. So that is something that is definitely contributing to cardiovascular disease. Um, it's oftentimes like indicative of vitamin deficiency just as a proxy on paper. So um the whole process itself is like your ability to methylate impaired can be problematic for cardiovascular disease and it is just kind of like a proxy to assess like i'm probably deficient in a bunch of different vitamins because i'm having to i'm having an impaired ability to clear this out of the blood essentially so like for me the 71 is like so sky high that it's like 100 percent representative of impaired methylation so for me I don't even think it's worthwhile necessarily to see if you have the gene polymorphism in a test. I think we can probably like guess like your brother has it, the, the blood metrics support it. And even if you didn't have it, like these are the steps that I would take personally to fix that. So I would want to see this at least like in the single digits by your next test. So I would add those supplements in. Um, you might, you might benefit from a methyl B12 supplement too, like methyl cobalamin, I believe it is. Right. Um, it, cause again, like you're eating red meat, like you're getting a fucking steak in a day or whatever it is. And if you're not getting enough B vitamins still, like maybe you benefit from a bit of B12 supplementation. So that might be something to look at potentially. And then from yeah, I've there, done, I've, I've done B12 shots before when I was like younger. When I, I was don't think. Yeah. Injections, I don't think are necessary. I think that's kind of like yeah. probably I would have to look into the science, but I'm pretty sure that's just like marketing potentially. Yeah. Or if hypothetically, if you had such a deficiency, you needed to get it like elevated fast. Right. Yeah. An injection I could understand because you're like fucking mega dosing it right into your circulation. But for you, like your B12 is normal. It's just low normal. So like I'd want to see it more like closer to the high end of normal personally. So Sweet. Those are the things I would do to address that. And I think that in itself, I don't know if you're going to see like an uptick in performance necessary, but maybe like mental clarity and your overall health, at least, you know, will be fixed, you know, to a certain extent. So, yeah, um, yeah that would be, that was like the primary thing I was uh, concerned with when I saw it. Now I would keep an eye on the TMAO though, because especially when you're supplementing with things like choline, that, that can elevate TMAO in the gut too. So that would be something to keep an eye on to see if that gets like elevated in unison with this new supplementation regimen. But overall, I think that is the move. So um, do you have any questions on like the MTHFR stuff that we could like dig into further? Um, do I have any questions on, on, on which stuff? The, the, the MTHFR, like the full oh. being low, the B12, the homocysteine being high. Um, no, I mean, that's helpful. I did pick up methylfolate 
um, like five days ago. I've been taking it. And uh, okay, I, I think I've noticed a, a mental difference. Yeah. People who have low folate, especially like there's so many random things that can go wrong. Like sometimes people, they end up with like migraines. Um, also like defects in children in women who are low, who have this polymorphism and they don't supplement with like methyl folate or have an adequate amount through their diet. They could end up with like neural tube defects in their fucking children. Like there's a lot of things that go into it that I think get overlooked. And like, this is why it's critical to be like, I think most people above and beyond the hitting their macros, there's something called chronometer.com. And it's like a more advanced version of my fitness pal. And there you can plug your diet in and actually shows you if you're hitting your RDAs for B vitamins, for nutrients, for minerals, for vitamins, blah, blah, blah. That I think is probably useful for people who don't know if their diet is like truly balanced. So it's not just about hitting your fat needs, your macros. That's important. And like the base, like foundation of if your diet's like good, but actual nutrients are like the things that are cofactors for producing hormones and making sure your health is not getting fucked up. So if you have a deficiency in something as basic as folate, you can see how it could impair something as dramatic as your homocysteine being literally like over seven X or it should be, which downstream would be. And it's like, you're a fucking, this is not representative of like bad health. Like this is just a random weird genetic predisposition that some people have. And you would never know if you didn't get your blood tested. So this is like why it's prudent to get diagnostics, even if you're like the most fucking yoked, lean, sick, natural, like in the industry, you know, like it doesn't, yeah. that sort of thing is just because you're metabolically healthy and you're lean, you're sub 10%, your test is good, you're strong. It doesn't mean that you're overall like guaranteed to be healthy. So it's worthwhile to get these like random biomarkers that give a more complete picture of like every organ system or as complete of a picture as you can get. So, yeah, you know what, this one, this one's really, really cool to see. And I was looking in that the, the low B12, I uh, was sorry, the low folate, it's uh, common in depression. And if that folate's too low, it can mess up with serotonin production and stuff like that. So, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay. So getting into the rest of the blood test metrics here, uric acid looks good. Phosphorus being a bit high, I would, um, but you have no supplements that have phosphorus in it, presumably. No. Okay. And it could have been like something you had in your diet, like the day before that artificially elevated it. Like sometimes I'll see B12 levels that are too high. Cause somebody had an energy drink. They have like 42,000% of the amount of B12. That's like the RDA in it. And they think they have cancer or something when in reality, it's just like something they ate. So I would get a follow-up on this, but I'm assuming it's diet related. It could be intertwined into this whole methylation cycle that if we support it, like maybe it just, it just corrects itself, but I don't have an answer necessarily as to why it's high. I would just keep an eye on it. If it's elevated more than one time, that's where you kind of dial in and be like, okay, like what the fuck is going on here? But I think a lot of this stuff should correct itself. Like the, uh, what was it? The alkaline phosphatase being low. Um, the specific gravity, I think was just a dilution error probably. Um, and the, the phosphorus being high was the main one that I think we would be most concerned about to check on again, cause it's not yeah. low, it's high. Uh, I was reading that like, you know, if your magnesium or zinc is, is too low, that phosphor, like it helps the high magnesium and zinc helps bring that down. So I think my magnesium is good, but for some reason I've, I've done a, a nutrient test before years ago and my zinc, even though I eat quite a bit of meat, my zinc was fairly low. So one thing, like if you're... Like your diet's pretty flexible. So I don't know how much your diet changes, but whatever like a normal day is for you, I think yeah. it could be worthwhile even for you just to plug it into chronometer and be like, how much zinc am I getting? And just like, see, because sometimes you could be surprised. You might be deficient as fuck in like one thing. And then if you, if you supplement with it, you can correct it and like fix a whole like slew of things that as a byproduct of that one mineral being low, like could fuck you up somehow. Like some people that are low in magnesium, they have like fucked up blood pressure and years of fucked up blood pressure results in them having like kidney degeneration or a heart problem or whatever. So that sort of thing is definitely worthwhile in my opinion. Um, like your diet's probably as balanced as you could get with the amount of calories you're eating and whatnot, and like the way you've allocated your macros, but maybe you need zinc supplementation. Like it would be worthwhile to plug it in potentially and see. Um, but, but, but. So progesterone being high, this is like, pretty uncommon um because this is something that is 
Uh, like it's not like crazy high. It's not like you have like female fucking territory levels or something, but um, I'm not concerned about this at all. I think it's transient. Just sometimes when you get like an elaborate panel at that snapshot in time, you might have something elevated or slightly decreased that otherwise would be like dead smack in the middle. And it could be just a result of your body's like current phase of producing hormones in your testicles and like converting certain hormones to what. And for a transient period of time, you have an elevated amount until they dip down until your brain to spit out more. And then boom, that snapshot on time just happened to represent a 10% boost on your blood test or something. So for me, I'm not too concerned about this. Again, this is not representative of hormone use at all. So it's kind of irrelevant, but potentially worthwhile to look at again, but I'm not like concerned about it or anything. Um, insulin 1.3. We already went over that. That is a sign of like extreme insulin sensitivity, metabolic health. From what I can tell, I would definitely get it checked again um, at like right when you wake up and see what it's at. But um, this could just be too, because you woke up, your glucose levels are at its highest when you wake up from, it's called the dawn phenomenon when your cortisol is at its highest and your glucose is elevated and you fast for a long time. So maybe as you're going deeper into your fasting window, you've ate nothing. So your insulin is just like rock bottom because it doesn't need to be high to pull glucose back down. So ultimately it is representative of like, this is one of the main metrics we look at for metabolic health and it looks really good. TPO, this is a thyroid antibody that we would want to look at more so if you had like a weird thyroid level and see if you have like an autoimmune response that is like attacking your thyroid gland and destroying it. And for you, it's just part of the elaborate panel, but it's not like I was really concerned about it for you or anything. So as expected, like undetectable, uh, T3 looks good. It's like right in the middle. It's not like, it's not high. It's not low. Like this is the main dictating factor from a hormonal perspective of your metabolism. So this is this T3 level is right where I'd want to see it personally. Um, SHBG, I think we covered that elaborately already. And then this NMR lipo profile is just a kind of visual representation of your lipids and how ideal they are, which I think we already touched on pretty elaborately way back at the start when I interpreted them. And again, I'm not a lipidologist or a cardiologist, so I'm just going based on my cursory glance of the, you know, data and whatnot. But ultimately everything looks natural for what I can tell um based on all the factors i've outlined already the only thing from a health perspective that's concerning is the methylation support so i think that you would definitely benefit highly from the betaine the creatine the choline potentially through diet or supplementation um and the methylfolates and b12 i think those would be and specifically methyl b12 rather than like the uh there's like different versions you can get so it's kind of like methylfolate versus folic acid there's like an equivalency for B12, the methylated, like activated version. So yeah, I think that would, I think that's it, man. So yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to get back on, you know, doing, you know, five grams creatine. I'm going to check out the, the, the butane. I haven't, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I haven't heard too much of that one. That one looks pretty, pretty interesting. So I'll check that one out. And then I have methylfolate and I have the B12 and, uh, I have some uh, alpha GPC. So yeah, I'm going to hit that. It's, it feels good to not just take random supplement, like, you know, different so it feels good to take supplements that like you're the targeted approach targeted as opposed approach. to just like randomly taking a fucking tons of shit yeah no it yeah. feels so i mean I'm, I'm i'm actually pumped to take those knowing that i'm, I'm i have that elevated hope and they're low um you know i'm glad that we you know did this and i i uh i was able to share those levels i'm definitely curious to see total testosterone free testosterone and some of those things when my you know after you know um getting really really good sleep and and then seeing what the homocysteine's at so I appreciate it, man. It was really, really, really valuable. I wouldn't have been able to um, basically figure out figure out all that all that stuff. I actually I saw the folate was low. I bought folic acid, and then you told me in the Instagram DM to, to get the methyl folate. Yeah. So, yeah, awesome, man. I'm glad we were able to make something you know educational out of it, above and beyond the just like assessing fucking natty status stuff, and potentially able to help your health in some capacity. And we can do a follow up after you've done this for. A certain amount of weeks and kind of try and correct things and then kind of go from there and if anyone wants to check out the uh, diagnostics they can get their own panels at merrickhealth.com and have a actual um have providers and patient care coordinators help interpret them and give them guided recommendations just like we did here except with like licensed you know providers um so definitely recommend that for anyone like again you notice greg is like the 
healthiest fucking guy, like super lean, super athletic, high performance. And even he has random things that we only could have found through blood testing. So it's definitely worthwhile to get, even if you're a young, healthy guy. So, you know, down the line, you're not building up to some like cardiovascular disease outcome or some kidney fucking issue or whatever that you could have corrected quickly and easily should you have got like proper proactive diagnostics to begin with. So, yeah, and I, I got to be. I got, I got to be hyper careful. Like in my family, we do have quite a bit of disease. Mm. So like, and I'm 30 now. So like, I'm like, I got to be like hyper careful on this thing. What so disease? Like, uh, cancer. Heart? MS. Oh. Um, yeah. So, mm. so I got to be like, you know, I got to, it be, makes you wonder though, like how much of this played into that as well for the genetic predispositions. Cause obviously this is hereditary, right? right? So could be worthwhile to impart this information on your family too, because they probably have the exact same shit. Yeah, there's a there is a I think there's a correlation with the MTHFR uh, morphism, low folate, and multiple sclerosis and stuff like that. So there's definitely you know so um, yeah no I I gotta be yeah yeah my my siblings I've gotta be like you know on, on the ball. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. All right, man. Thanks for chatting for pushing probably fucking three hours at this point, but I think it was informative. I'm glad we covered the training stuff because it's not something I cover too often on my channel. I think that could have been really valuable. And um, hopefully people, you know, check out your stuff if they want to learn more, if they want to follow you. It's is it Kino Body on all the platforms or is it Gregor Gallagher um, on Instagram? Yeah, or? yeah you, you, uh, if you go to Instagram, you search Kino Body or Gregor Gallagher, you'll find me there. Um, and, you know, Kino Body has my masterclass uh, program. And I think you you rock in the Kino clothing a lot. So I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, long sleeves are dope, man. Love them. Yeah. Appreciate that big time, man. Well, yeah, thanks again. Awesome. All right, guys. Uh, like, subscribe, check out his channel, like mentioned, and I'll talk to you guys soon.